I'm ready whenever you are. Sorry. We're going live. All right. Going live. Yay. Hey. I want to do a little intro here. Hey, first and foremost, happy when a Thursday. Thank you so much for joining. I am happy Samantha LaDuke, founder of LaDukeTrading.com, and I am very pleased to be joined by Vicki Bryan. Hopefully you'll see this in my screen share. We've got a feature going here where it is uh, my Tuesday, Thursday macro to micro power hour. And on Thursdays, I like to feature a woman in trading and finance. And I have followed Vicki for a few years. She is very much focused on the bond market and also Tesla. I mean, talk about insightful um, analysis, forensic accounting, um, just the whole kind of sentiment read as well. Um, so I'm really pleased to welcome Vicki Bryan. Thank you so much for joining. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. This is a great idea. Yeah, this is this was, you know, kind of um, this idea that I want women to see what they can be. And there are few, um, you know, far in between women who are in trading and analysis that are kind of prominent, if you will. And FinTwit is just a fabulous way for me to find, um, you know, analysts, colleagues, mentors. It's just been a phenomenal experience. And then I started assembling a list, um, women in you know, trading and finance, the WTF kind of acronym, the hashtag, if you will, and then decided, I want to talk to them like we've never met. Like, I can see you on Twitter. I can see your stuff. I can see your writing. And I'm excited about this, but I, don't, I didn't really think of a way of how to promote it a little bit more. So I just started this, um, and I want to have it kind of live in this world of macro to micro, but with a feature on women in trading and finance. So you, like I said, I'm going to just real quick share your blog as well, because this is where I have found you first and foremost. This is the two, a little housekeeping. This is my Tuesday, Thursday macro to micro power hour um, today, obviously featuring Vicki Bryan. And when we are done this interview, I will be posting it on my website uh, which will also be linked to my YouTube channel. You can sign up, subscribe. It'll be down here. So I have a few playlists. Um, this is for the, uh, you know, macro to micro. It's trading insights. It's special presentations and women in trading and finance. So I had an energy on, analyst on um, last time, Julia um, Cordova, as many know, futures trader, um, Juliette de Klerk, a macro analyst, what a, you know, just phenomenal, and on and on and on. So I'm excited to be able to do this, and this is where you will find the uh, listing of the on, on my YouTube channel. And then, um, this is also a podcast, Vicki. So my marketing director, you know, came up with this. So we are actually live on a, bod, um, on a podcast, uh, as well as YouTube, and of course, as a webinar. This is your blog. So I want you to introduce yourself um, this is your bond angle, which I absolutely love, and your your attention to high yield markets, market movers, trying to spy trouble, if you will, in equity markets from your analysis on credit markets. And I'm a, a big believer that credit leads equities, at least until we had this abnormal behavior last year, <laughs> when everything just went, you know, haywire. <laughs> right. Right. So um, I'm going to stop sharing and do us a favor of giving us a little bio on you. Share how you got into this space. Um, okay. Well, uh, and and first of all, thank you. This is a this is a great idea. I listened to some of your other guests, and you've just got some fascinating people on here. But I'm interested in the how many similarities among us that I that I've noticed. Those that have been in a business for several years that I heard you know, heard in your guests as well. So it's, it's kind of interesting. It's definitely, we've chosen to be in a male dominated world. Uh, I mean, industry and, and it is what it is. And those of us have been doing for years. It's not that different today than it's been for a long time. And that's not a good thing. So it's good that you're calling attention to um, leadership that's, that's out there and, and, and then called me also. So yes, I'm glad. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I came into it uh, interesting I don't know. I kind of a long path. Now, just just talking, just the career moves. I started as uh, in banking, and uh, in in Texas, and um, women in banking, you were not even allowed to wear pants back then, much less make any really actual, you know, money. And so I got really irritated with that 
pretty quickly and, jo and I joined Merrill Lynch and uh, as a stockbroker. So, and I, that was at a time that there were also no women. In fact, the entire time I was a broker, which was almost five years, there was no other women except a woman that I recruited in the wow. office. So, yeah. And uh, it was, uh, that was quite a trip um, being a broker there. I, I liked it, but then I felt like, you know, I mean, Merrill Lynch didn't really care if you knew anything, you know, you just sell. That's all you, that's all he cared about. And I really just felt like a vinyl siding salesman, you know, and I mean, literally, it, 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 you know, I mean, I was just really good at selling vinyl siding, but, you know, yeah, I wanted to know, I was, a, I was there because I wanted to know the market. So I had worked my way up to be a branch manager, you know, bank manager, you know, little small podunk banks and, um, and all I could do really for customers is, you know, I could make, give them a good you know, interest rate on a loan or a good interest rate on a CD. And that's kind of it. And I just really wanted to get, do more and, and got interested in more. So Maryland's really wasn't doing it for me. I mean, all they cared for you to do is to read whatever Dick McCade said on the screen. And I only had one year to think I was smart because less than a year after I joined, you know, crash of 87. So I discovered Maryland Lynch didn't know either. Nobody knew. And that, oh, that's wow. the first thing I do. I'm naturally wired. Like, how did this happen? We are um, a curious bunch, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. But also, you know, I'm not afraid of what I discovered also is that I'm in a room full of men and they are losing their uh, stuff. <laughs> okay. I'll try to manage my language. I noticed that, you know, I can get salty and I call that you call people out for them and I don't, I don't want to be salty. But anyway, men were losing it. They were throwing their Quatron boards and everything, which is awful. The Maryland's knew this and they didn't tell us and, da, da, da. and the phones are ringing off the wall because all the discount brokers wouldn't answer the phone. And it was, it was a crazy day. And I just kind of fell into that. You know how that zone you fall into? And I know other, I've talked to other women that do that stuff is happening and you just suddenly get a, an ultra uber calm. Yep. Yeah. What's going on? Because Quotron has all the numbers are going down and then they started going back up. So Quotron is not working. We don't know what anything costs. We don't know what anything's going on in the market. So I just started calling my clients because whatever's happening is big. And it had started, this is a Monday and it started the previous Friday. And I flew home from New York, uh, Princeton, Merrill Lynch's facility out there. Um, I was out there getting an award or whatever. And I was like, you know, yay. And then market starts crashing. We're like, Ooh, I went home. And so I started calling my clients and I wanted them to hear from me first. We don't know what's happening today, but something big is happening and we don't want to do anything until we understand what it, what this, what this is and what this means. And I'm just wanted you to know what's happening and this is the plan and so on and so forth. So I'm starting calling my customers and every single one, except one, it was actually that my tiniest customer, but my was, was calm. And they were like, gosh, you know, thanks. The calmest one I had was a woman and she was like, 70 and most of her virtually all of her portfolio was like you know the big nifty 50 you know exxon mostly exxon and she had lost more than half of her portfolio before quotron stopped working value of that as of that day and she's like you know vicky just go home make yourself glass tea you know we're going to talk this is all going to settle out i'm not selling anything and i'm like okay but i just want she goes no you need to calm down and i mean you need to i said well i'm, I'm okay i just want to make sure okay she goes i'm fine and that was very interesting, the differences in the way people were reacting. And then the first thing I did after that was set out to figure out who knew this was going to happen. Why did it happen? Could it, you know, why was everyone so wrong? And, and that kind of got me on my journey. Well, the more I got into that, the more I was disenchanted with Merrill Lynch because they really didn't care. Just, you know, keep people buying more, you know, and keep everybody from leaving. And so I kind of, I, I just finally started looking for something else. And I joined a, a asset management company in Houston called AIM. It's now in Vesco. Uh, and that was the most perfect place I could have ever landed. I kind of left out the first part of my bio because I started from a place of, I had a really dark, violent childhood. Um, and it was, you know, I mean, literally dangerous, not, not, you know, like, oh my, they didn't understand. No, they, it was a dangerous place to be. And as soon as I was able, uh, when I was 15 in Texas, you could get a a hardship license. And so I got my driver's license and I got a 66 Ford custom for $250. And it was awesome. 289, three on the tree was white with red vinyl interior, which was very special. And I left and I left home. I was been on my own ever since. And so I finished high school and got was fourth in the class. I got a Moody scholarship, got my degrees, mm. master of science and finance and master of science and finance. I had all that kind of stuff. I did all that learning through my childhood and such that you are on your own. You make yourself safe. You look out for the vulnerable yourself. Wow. You don't wow. believe people that are people that are, are supposed to be 
people that are supposed to protect you will not, and they could cause you harm. And people that you're supposed to trust, you can't believe what they say. They will lie. They will have other, you know, I learned all these lessons as a, as a child, you know, very, you know, that's what I learned. But I also learned that there are, there are, there are other things. It's not like it's dark, dark and doubt. And that came from my teachers and my coaches, because as it turned out, I was a gifted student or whatever. And even as early as elementary school, my, I would get selected for these programs. And so in the summertime, school was my refuge and sports were my refuge. I was really good in school and sports. And, you know, I mean, I liked track and softball. That was my thing. But, uh, and then, you know, all manner of things that I taught myself, music and I wrote, you know, plays and poetry. And, you know, I mean, I was a weird kid, but um, this was my refuge. But the summertime was the worst, the, the most, you know, that was, that was the most dangerous time because there was no place to go but be home. So my teachers would, they had these programs that for gifted students or whatever, and they'd be marvelous. And they would be all these science programs and you can go and you can study the, 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 you know, the life cycle of a chicken, or you could go out and, you know, uh, you know, archaeology kind of, a fa kind of a quasi dig or, you know, all these kinds of things and different sciences that I didn't know about and different things that I didn't know about and math camp and all these kinds of stuff that was just amazing. And science is a solution. And science teaches you that there's always new ways of thinking. And that's how I'm wired anyway. I mean, you know, there's always a contingency. There's always a way of getting at something or getting out of something. And science and math, and they, they do that. And, it'll, and the higher up you go and the more deeper you get into it, it's fun because you, there's lots of different ways you can get to it. And that, I love that. And then I had art for my creative side, which I think science is also creative. But I mean, I had all these things to do that in my music and I had my sports and these were programs I would get picked for. But what my parents did want, it's not like, it's not like, you know how, you know, you have your kids, you want your head to kids, better, better life and better things. I'm right. Well, that wasn't true. They quit high school, you know, early and then had me and kind of thing. So, you know, me advancing, that's sort of, they resented that, which is, I know it's weird, but anyway, they did. So they didn't want to call <laughs> attention to it because next thing you know, I'm going to be this uppity kid. I'm going to want to go to be a college graduate. Is that, that was their pronunciation and go off and be, you know, I'm supposed to be a teacher or a nurse until I get married. And that's it. End of story. That's all I was allowed wow. to do. Anything else was a disappointment. And I was just, you know, showing off being a big stuff. So the teachers oh would God, wait, send them these things home, though the teachers oh, would send oh. these notes home and say, you know, we would like Vicki to be in this, you know, special uh, gift and talented program, blah, 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 blah. And they would just ignore it. And they didn't want me to go to these things and they didn't want to pay for anything, which they weren't. I was, you know, I was picked. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it wasn't like you had to pay to go, but they didn't want to, you know, so the teachers would come to the house. So we don't want people to come into our house, right? Because there could be, so the teachers would come anyway and make sure that I would get in that program. So that taught me, yeah. and maybe I'm not alone and maybe that there are people and maybe right that, there. you know, I, you know, and that's what got me through. So by the time I was able to leave when I was 15, I had some pretty, you know, healthy skepticism of authority and faith in myself and protection of the vulnerable and my sense of justice, you know, it's good and truthfulness. And, you know, if you're not telling the truth, why? And, you know, and, and, you know, I'm hesitant when you start, the more hostile you get, I'm probably right. And you're, these are good, this is a good training to have a career in finance, especially oh if you want to focus gosh. on <laughs> trouble companies, right? It, no, but it's, it's, it's amazing because, you know, this behavioral science experiment, which, which, you know, our personal life experiences yeah. come together and form yeah. everything that makes you such a curious resilient um, and strong and person and going person into a male and dominated analyst. place yes. because what do the men do it, or especially in the early years okay you're not good enough um you're you know we're going to get this guy the, the promotion and not you we're going to pay this guy more and not you it, it makes you kind of stand up and go oh hell no and i wasn't afraid to do that and so i would you know i mean you're going to rub people wrong and things like that but you know did you, know, you always whatever. have that strong voice yeah I did. okay <laughs> Because it was really literally, though, I learned it was, I'm not like, you know, you know, you had no people that they're just threatened and it's outraged and they've never been in danger in their entire life, really. Yeah. Okay. Remember, I'm in Texas. All right. So everybody gets 
you know, all, you know, you got to have your long gun, your Glock, because we're going to go to Walmart or we're going to go get a cheeseburger, but they won't wear a mask for the deadly pandemic because freedom. But, you know, these are, this is the kind of outrage. No, I had actual danger and I faced it down and I learned survival and I learned what was real risk and what's perceived risk. I learned that, you know, failure just means I didn't do it right. Why? And I go after it. So I'm not afraid to fail. And I'm not, I am not, you know, I am strong on my own two feet. And I was also always tiny and small against a big mean foe monster whatever and i you, you face them down so go into finance <laughs> you tell the man. Not there. <laughs> oh my god I mean, you know i mean there you go right? I, 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 right? I, have, I have jokingly said not so jokingly that i'm a volatility trader because i raised three teenagers so <laughs> you live it. It, I mean, it, what else can happen to you right I you mean, know i'm not fr- yeah it, halloween doesn't scare me it's just right. the, the, the whole um resilience but it wasn't just in all in my mind literally, <laughs> you're right but it wasn't just all in my mind literally in my interview at merrill lynch two things in the interview that i'll never forget stuck out it pissed me off and I, I barely i just pretty much lit into the guy first of all is that he's like now you have to imagine this is a little you know, leprechaun looking guy, a little little troll, big bushy eyebrows and a stogie hanging out of his mouth. New York all day long. I mean, New York <laughs> literally, literally sent people down to teach us how to talk to Southern people. This is New- Merrill Lynch at the time, yep, right? Yep. And he's telling me, because I'm the only woman that he's ever hired. I, maybe they had, they were, they were getting in trouble for not having women. I don't yeah, know, yeah. not hired women. I was not going to be a secretary or, or work in the trading, you know, back in the trading room, putting the trades in. I was going to be a broker like everybody, like all the other men. And he was very uncomfortable with that, but he was also very proud of himself because he's so evolved. But he did have to explain to me now, Vicky, this has to be your only job. I don't mean, I mean, there, there's no dance on, you know, in the strip joints on Telephone Road. I mean, this is your only job. If you need to make money, you know, that's it. And I'm like, well, I'm not a stripper. <laughs> of course, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully my face didn't do that, but I don't know what my face did, but he didn't register that I had done a big F you back at him. And so I mean, <laughs> He didn't register that. So apparently he thought he was really being helpful to me, that I really have to try hard this job because I can't just go and do my regular stripping to, <laughs> you know, to make ends meet as you would. So, and then the second thing was that, you know, being the only woman in an office and I'm looking around at all these virile male specimens around me, including him, that if they're in the inevitable chance that there's a problem, that production stays, whatever, you know, comes up, whoever gets fired, it's going to be production. And I'm like looking around, like, you know, first of all, um, what makes you think it won't be my production that stays? Because it will be. And second of all, in answer to your other question, the most proud, and he's sitting there smoking and blowing up the most proud thing I've done. I said, well, I quit smoking. So, <laughs> you know, anything else? Because, you know, I really, I've got to go. And I left. I walked out of the van. I got hired. So, you know, because I was scrappy. <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, this is this was my experience at, you know, at Merrill Lynch and you go through it. And I really worked hard to, you know, to learn the market and understand the market. But at the same time, you're fighting the whole trade because, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but you know, let's just let's just do the trade and then come up with a big program. You know, we're all selling uh, today. We're all selling uh, insurance products because, you know, you got an 8 percent commission and everybody everybody go. And so, you know, I, I get disenchanted. So when I went to AIM, that's when I, that's a whole big setup. I don't know how it got so long, but AIM was the most perfect place to go. Why? The most perfect time because it was run by a man called Ted Bauer. Ted Bauer was old fart from, from American General. He had worked his way up. He was a big guy there. And he left AIM with two other guys and they started the first money market mutual fund. Oh. And that's what AIM started with. Now, later they added bond funds and, uh, uh, small cap growth funds. And I mean, they were really, really successful, but Mr. Bauer didn't care if you were a man, woman, whatever he wanted talent and he nurtured it. And he, and he wanted to hear your ideas, you know, how you go around and you can see people's eyes glazed over, you know, what about if we did? And they're like, oh, we always do it. That why are you always asking? No, no, not there. He wanted to hear what you had to say. And in fact, if you didn't have questions, you're over there quiet. So like, you know, you're not thinking, you know, you don't have any, ob- you don't have any input on this. And I'm like, oh, I have input. Do you want my input? You know, yes, he did. And that was, I spent 12 years there. And that was just a glorious place to learn the markets. And there, that momentum training was, was big at that time. That's when it was really, really taken off. And that uh, AIM, AIM made a whole lot of money. We had really, you know, really successful funds, you know, 
particularly in momentum training. But that was, you know, where I really learned all these things. And I fell into high yield markets there because, you know, everybody, everybody was doing equity, but, you know, high yield was kind of, you know, at the time, especially uh, you had, you know, Drexel had blown up and, you know, Michael Milken was a crook and, you know, woo, high yield, I don't, I don't know. And to me, it was kind of like, I want to do it because everybody's afraid to do it. It's sort of at the time, you know, you had the, uh, the door over there and the IT guys are behind that door and I don't know what happens in there and I don't want to know what happens in it. Well, bonds were like that. People didn't understand bonds. So I, and it's particularly companies that were in trouble and marginal and they had run the company in the ground or they're about, or trying to save it from, you know, being destroyed or whatever's happening. They're in trouble or they wouldn't be there. To me, that adds a lot of value there. Because it's only in that it's only half the value battle is the numbers because we know they're in trouble. Can they grow their way out of it? Can they get better? Can they uh, can they last? Is this a team that's going to do it? You know, you know all these things. So I thought it was fascinating. That's where I started, and that was in the late '90s. Um, and so I was there 12 years. Now the problem with them is that they sold it. They you know they all got they who, who wouldn't want to just get rich, be a billionaire, okay, or keep working. So they did. <laughs> And so I stayed longer than I should because after it was sold, of course, the heart, the company I fell in love with just, you know, dissolved away and I was brokenhearted and I stayed too long. But anyway, whatever it, that's what happened. But I went to Gimme Credit, which is a New York based bond, bond shop. And I was able to be like technically on the sales side, but we don't make a market. So I was able to not be beholden to the issuers and be an independent, you know, and just call it, call it as I see it. And so I was there for 10 years. So I really enjoyed that. But, uh, you know, over time, you just kind of get, I was doing a third of the high yield there. And I just felt like, I, sh- I could just, I just want to do this my way. I'm doing to do it on my own. And so I left in 2017 and then um, finally got bond dangled up and running like 2018. It is still a work in progress. I need to add my other coverage. I've only really posted stuff publicly on Tesla and WeWork and SoftBank. And, you know, some of the really, you know, big dramas I'm working on the we work SPAC report right now. So that'll be coming out, but you know, it's just fun, but I love being able to um, do, do what it. You want. Do it what I want, when I want, how I want. I've got a lot of things planned for bond angle. And, and, you know, I know a lot of where a lot of smart women are parked that are not able to work doing what they want to do or to up yeah. to their potential. And, you know, they're just not getting hired. I um, mean, you can look on LinkedIn. It's like, you know, congratulate Bob, congratulate Joe. It's a new position, yeah. and, but you don't see it. Is oh, hello, Mary place. just got a new job. You don't yeah. really see that much. Yeah. And so, you know, I like that. that was level kind of, it up. Like level it up. Good. Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of, that's how I, that's how I got here. Hey, I, I'm blown away. <laughs> I'm all, there, first of all, there's so much that resonates with me. Um, the fact that I do my own thing is because restriction is not my jam. Mm-hmm. And this is, I can study anything I want. I like to, you know, look at data and, you know, connect the dots within, you know, this scanning and synthesizing skill that I have across macro and intermarket and technical and sentiment and fundamental and quant. And there's mm-hmm. just restriction is not my jam. Right. So then I can really feel rotation. I can feel, you know, the, 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 the danger also. So right. it isn't just, you know, the, and chase I'll, it down. And chase it down and not be afraid of it where a lot of people are afraid of volatility. I am. I, I want to understand it. I want to understand it and when it's going to erupt and then how to take advantage of it. So for me, it's very, I, I jokingly say, cause I raised three teenagers, but it is true. I, I, I believe that this is natural. It volatility is. is natural. It so, is, but it's also, you know, we've really kind of evolved into a different work, you know, different market. Uh, climate than anybody has ever it's, seen. I mean, we've not seen this level of irrationality and we've not seen this, this actual, you know, such gulfs in actually where the funding is coming from and people, you know, squeal at the Fed, but they forget that, you know, and like in 2019, I, I was looking up to check the dates uh, last night. Um, most of the market uh, drive higher in 2019 was companies buying back stock. Mm-hmm. They bought trillions back exactly. in stock. That was four trillion. They they spent more buying back stock than the Fed, you know, uh, the Fed uh, liquidity surge, and that's huge. That's that's done. That's you know, they bought bonds and bought bad stock, and you know, they borrowed bonds to fund it and all kind of stuff, and didn't have a penny, you know, for the rainy day if COVID might hit, for example, to be able to stay keep it running. Yep. But uh, anyway, they got the bay, the bailout. But anyway, that's a very um, that's a solid point. That the buybacks. 
Um, it, I mean, globally, obviously, we've had more, much more, 23 trillion, whatever, and stimulus alone, 5 trillion. But you're right. That I mean, that's that's, that's a, a big point. number. That's a big that's a number. Big number and, it's, and it's done. So there's a lot of things like that. We've got cult stocks. I can track back in uh, my career watching how the behavior of the investor has changed. For example, if you go back to like 2011, um, American Airlines was on the point of uh, brink of bankruptcy. Okay, yep. it was the only bank airline at that time that had not gone bankrupt, and the whole market was, oh hell no, they're not going to bank. They have six billion dollars in cash. And I'm like, they're burning three hundred million a day. So, so the step so I was had a problem with that. But step two, the reason that people were convinced because you know labor's going to cave. Labor has always caved. They're, they're going to bust the unions like they always bust the unions. Screw the workers. Blah blah blah. You know, gay American Airlines, and I'm like, no, I don't think so. Um, you know. My clearly blue collar, you know, roots. You know, I, I still re I know how it is to live and be actually be hungry. Under like a lot of people I'm talking to, and actually not be able to make it. Bit and what happens when the whole town and American Airlines had really screwed the workers. You know, by 2011, they had laid off like 25 percent of their workforce since 2003, which is the last time that they were going to be in trouble. And in 2003, labor gave up the huge concession, 1.3 billion. In price, you know you know, wage cuts and it was huge and, you know, cut down. And by 206, 2006, they were, you know, American Airlines was back to back in, back in business. I call it, you know, companies that keep cutting to their blood turns green. Well, by <laughs> 2006, they were green. Okay. And what they did was give huge bonuses to management and they bought this, you know, they had this wonderful town, you know, multi-million dollar townhouse in London. They had all this cool stuff. And labor was like, we're still bleeding here. They laid off the equivalent of half the population of Galveston, Texas. That's how long, that's how much, pe how many people they had laid off by the time it got to be, we were back at 2011. And they were like, well, you know, sorry guys, we need another 1.6 billion and cutting labor. I could see that they were going to go screw it. No, no, we'll take our chances of bankruptcy. No. And Mark, the market was like, not. And that's what happened. And I not only, that was one time when I was like, not only, could tell they were going to file bankruptcy. I could tell they had like uh, a few hundred million, eight or 900 million left in unencumbered assets, really old jets, old planes. And they did a bond deal with that as the asset package. So I'm like, they're scraping the barrel now. They're loading up with as much cash as possible, then file bankruptcy so they could jam the workers, you know, jam the labor. And that's what they did. And that was a huge deal. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. And that in 2011, all I just said, that's normal. I had a position. Okay. I, I was reading cash flow. I was reading operations. I was reading labor relations. And I came up with my solution for my chair. I think it's bankruptcy. And I said, I think it will happen by Christmas. I missed it by a couple of weeks. And the, the other side of the market, which was, you know, most everybody, I was, you know, the country and it, it happens. But they were like, you know, they have plenty of cash. They won't file. And, you know, labor will cave and they'll be great because they won't file and they'll have all this cash and like, cut costs and all the kind of stuff. Yay them. And, you know, so that's normal. Right. It worked out the way I thought it would. But that's a normal deal. OK, 2012. Then you have Navistar International. Now, this was different because Navistar was a big chunky company and they'd for two years been gaming the system. They were going to design their own proprietary system for emissions, you know, treating emissions. And everybody else had gone another way. And theirs worked. And two years after the deadline, you're supposed to be EPA compliant. And Navistar was like, you know, no, we did another test. Not quite there yet. They hadn't reported what's going on the test. Why are they still not compliant? Why are they still? And then now all the other trucking companies are like, you know, screw you. We're going to sue you now. And we're going to sue the EPA because you're giving Navistar an unfair competitive advantage by not making them. We spent hundreds of millions to do that. And Navistar spent three times what we did. They're still not compliant. And we are. We're following the rules. We're selling the trucks. And Navistar's not. And they get, you know, better mileage and all kinds of things because they're having all these. It's not fair. Well, I was like, you know what? Here's what I think. Navistar can't ever meet the standards. They know it. The EPA knows it. And they don't have a plan B. That was my case. Now, that's the first time it came up with Carl Icahn says, well, you know, Carl Icahn comes in and buys and buys a bunch of stock. That's the first time I started getting the whole pushback. You know, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but Carl Icahn's buying it. It's, you know, Vicki, the smart money is buying, you know, like, okay, well, the stupid money here from the chair, my where I'm sitting, I think this. But that was a, it was people were sort of willing to accept, like, yeah, I hear what you're saying, and that's weird, but 
it's Carl Icahn. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I've been across from Carl Icahn because I was a gaming analyst for decades, you know, so I've been across the table from Carl Icahn before. He screamed at me before, personally, you know, yelled at me that I'm wasting his time and I don't deserve to exist. So yeah, that, I mean, <laughs> so that's gotta be on the resume. Just, I'm yes, sorry, I that's have, gotta have its own bullet. personally bullets. insulted by Carl Icahn. Can you say that? So, <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, I was like, you know, okay, Carl Icahn, he's, he's a billionaire. He's got a prettier crystal ball than I do, but it's not necessarily a better one. And so that's how it worked out. Exactly. Like I said, they, you know, within a couple of months or so, they had to say, okay, it's never going to work. And they almost went bankrupt and they had to redesign everything on the fly and buy their interest from Cummins. It was a big mess. But anyway, that was, I thought that was weird. Fast forward two years, 2014, Valiant Pharmaceuticals. And Valiant Pharmaceuticals, Bill Ackman had come forward and like, you know, we love the, the, the guys the, is run by a brilliant visionary CEO. He is, you know, uh, I have personally vetted this and I am me, I am Bill Ackman. So enough said. And at the time, I was like, no, I'd covered Valiant Pharmaceuticals for 20 years, ever since it was ICN Pharmaceuticals. And it's a pile of goo. And when they were getting ready to go buy Allergan, I was like, and we'll get into that later when we talk about the differences between credit analysis and stock analysis. And that's Tesla and Valiant. There's some similarities. But anyway, the point was, that was all the market cared about, that Ackman's in, so we're in. And I was like, wow, that's weird. And so you have the case. It all There's always been out. the case for celebrity CEOs and activists. Well, but not, I had never seen it just completely just discount, just like just blind. You mean right eyes, now with the whole stack. Yes. That was new to be to that degree okay. back okay. then. That was new. And I had put my cell on the bonds at May 1, 2014. And at that time, there was just a handful of people. Jim, Jim Chanos had come out. Chanos had come out and said, you know, he'd actually sent his numbers to Bill Ackman and said, you know, um, I don't think you're seeing this and, and here's this and this and then here's my work and everything. And, and Bill, I just dismissed him. Oh, Jim, you just don't, you don't know. Jim Chanos doesn't understand how to analyze this company. <laughs> That's arrogance. So anyway, but that was weird. And I like, okay. So I put the sell out on the bonds 20, you know, May 1, 2014 and the bonds, that was the peak on the bonds. They continue to fall for the next year and a half until the stock crashed. The stock continued to go to crazy town. Because unlike stock, bonds mature. There are there are criteria, and bondholders, you know, it matters these factors that were a problem with value. And I'll get into later, but that was weird. So then coming forward, uh, you know, of course, value blew up and all kind of thing. But that's the first time I noted that it was just pull pure celebrity. But this set the stage for you know we work forty seven billion dollars, you know, pile of rubble. And Tesla, you know, the, the complete just blind uh, adoration for the for the CEO, for the, you know, the car, the whole thing it, it, without I don't even want to hear the, the, the other side of the case is I don't even want to hear what you have to say, because I love it. I love it. I love it. And that's all I want to hear. And it's like, that's not a strategy. And, you know, the other side to that is, well, you're just a hater. Well, no, I'm not a hater. I no, that's not a strategy either. Um, I just, here's what I'm looking for. Here are my concerns. And I just kind of plod forward. But where we have now, that's facilitated by this unprecedented liquidity so that people can be, you know, it's always been that you can be in the, you know, wrong, right a long time, but still be wrong if the stock's going against you. With the bond mm -hmm. market, it's different because we don't have that liquidity. And high yield market is really different because that's where you really don't have liquidity if things go wrong. So whereas the stock is like, people are looking for a place to jump in and out and pick off um, bonds, you kind of have to position for in between the, the events, the catalyst, the, you know, what the hell, holy crap days, you need to already be there. Cause if you need to get in or out, <laughs> I wrote one, an article bonds, um, are like stocks without a circuit breaker. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, and it's still done mostly by, you know, it's not like you could just, you know, it's, you can't just pull up easily and, and buy or, you know, trade bonds and get volumes that, you know, get levels and things like that. Um, it's not that. And so um, it's, it's just different. So, you know, the people that you, 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 and I don't get a lot of nasty stuff on Twitter or anything like that, but I mean, the, the things that I'll get will be like, well, you're just been wrong the whole time. Well, you, A, you haven't read anything I've ever written. So how do you know? <laughs> but B, no, I'm, I have, you know, what the things I was worried about have played out like I was concerned and, you know, and here's, and if you'll notice in the bonds, 
have behaved accordingly. In fact, the bonds are not even acting. If you look at the bond m numbers, mm -hmm. the bond chart, it don't look like the stock chart. Stock's like, you know, wee, oh no, wee, oh no. The bonds <laughs> are like, ah, you yeah. know, because we're coming mm -hmm. under wary. What the bonds are trading on right now, uh, 104-ish, because the bonds, the market's betting that Tesla's not going to refinance these bonds because they're callable now. So those bonds became callable last summer at 103. And so the market is betting, uh, and that drops down in August to like 102 and change. So the market's betting they're not going to refinance these bonds. And so we're willing to pay more than even the call price for these bonds, which, you know, that yield is not, I'll get into later why that yield is, you know, is uh, too tight, too rich for what Tesla's credit quality is. But that's what the market's betting. And my concern is Elon, Tesla, they don't like to pay, they don't pay off debt. They don't like to pay off debt. They like to push things out as long as possible. And if we're all, those of us that are concerned are, are right, and this is the year that Tesla starts having really unprecedented competitive pressure and, you know, margin pressure, it just can't seem to get past. And all of these kinds of things, confluence of those things happen this year, then the sentiment toward those bonds will also erode as well. And so if you were going to be someone who doesn't like to pay off debt, and your bonds are being are trading in the market for kind of really ridiculously cheap yield versus your 5.3% coupon number, you would, re, you would refinance those bonds now while you could, while the market's like, we love you, Tesla, and push that out for 10 years instead of having it mature in 2025. So, you know, in four years. So I think, you know, I think that that's what the bar, the bond market is, is thinking about. Whereas the stock market's going, you know, they're going to have an insurance company. It's going to be great. <laughs> and, and, you know, those kinds of topics and things like that. And the bond market's going, oh, you know, they're looking at things, you know, the Vickies out here, we're going, I'm, I don't know. Why, why did that happen? And why, why is this? Why, why? These questions, these inconsistencies are troubling. And um, are, are they going to refinance the bonds now or not? You know, and it's and it's kind of a pivot point because the cost. When do they have to decide? Anytime. I mean, it's they're callable now. They could do it anytime. They could do it anytime they want. They've had a make hole until last year, and then you know that's really expensive to redo. But as of last year, it was, you know, it was uh, down to call price. And so, so what if they do? Year, what if they don't? What what's the impact on equity price in your opinion? Well, here you know, I think the the, the nagging reason about why would they not. And in Tesla, you always come back to, for example, disclosure. When you bring new things to market, you have to disclose things. You have to bring more, you know, and the level of disclosure is, you know, on a new issue, you know, for a new bond issue. You know, maybe there's something that is happening and they really don't want to go into it now. Um, I don't know. But I mean, you've got to wonder because the cost of it, the cost to get it done, you know, it costs money to bring a bond issue out. But if you're going to save, I mean, they're spending $100 million, you know, close to that right now on whatever it is on the 5.3% notes, it could save $20 million easily if they drop the yields down to 4% coupon versus 5.3% coupon. And that may not sound like a whole lot, but remember that this is Elon, I mean, this is Tesla that, that kept the six little peanut $60 million notes from Maxwell Technologies still on a balance sheet. Why would you not just pay that off if you got billions in cash? Why are you keeping that little dude out there? Why did you pay off? Why did you not pay off a little solar city note? Why did you keep pushing that out for month, uh, several quarters a year instead of paying it off? And it was like 100 million, 140 million, whatever it was. Why aren't you paying your bills? In fact, why doesn't why does Tesla pay their bills late still? Why do they have accounts receivable? All these little, I'm getting, I'm getting way ahead of the game, but the whys, that's a question. And to me, that brings concerns. And that would be, you know, those concerns, which could, that's where you translate. That's the trend crossover to equity. There's problems there that maybe they don't want to address right now. And they don't want us to know about right now. That would factor into equity. So the things that I'm asking to go around, it has to do with a bond deal. Why not do a bond deal? But that's why maybe equity that investors would be interested. Because the big risk for Tesla this year, the simplest way to put it, is disappointing. Okay? It's disappointment. This They're is why I love earnings to, season is we really get to have a little bit more um, look at the market. A little bit more, action. but we'll have to see if people really start, because right now, people if people are still too ready to discount it, well, psh, you know. And but, right now, everything has been discounted. Yeah. Archegos yeah. didn't matter. Credit Suisse, you know, $10 billion no. write-off, and it's a $24 billion. It didn't matter. I mean, there's just... It, and at some point, though, at some point, though, it will, it's, it's going suddenly. to matter, because what we've got... You know, the larger picture, the macro picture is also all about 
disappointing because last year, this time this year, it was supposed to be like, COVID's gone, we got the vaccine. And we weren't counting on the, uh, you know, the psychological part of it that you have. I mean, I'm in Texas. We, you know, wearing a mask is a contact sport here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're just really like drawing a line. You know, by God, I want it. I can't oh my God. That, that, I'm using that line. That is awesome. It's, I'm, I'm serious. So this is the kind of psychology that you're not, people aren't considering. And what that means is that we could be continuing to dis discount wrong. How long before we're past the pandemic? How long before we're past the, the effects? How are we doing about, what are we doing about these still millions of people that are either out of a job or still financially devastated by what's happened so far? That didn't go away overnight. I but mean, all these it, things has, it, it has a very high psychological cost, but as long as the Fed, the Fed balance sheet skill, uh, keeps growing, there is this you know invisible hand but there's two things that's happening right what the market is not the world it's not reality and no, it's, and when and when not. the economy doesn't the only thing that's happening that's positive the, the thing that's happening positive now is that the, the stimulus that's happening now is for the first time directly aimed and targeted at vulnerable at the vulnerable people mm -hmm. the vulnerable people and the specific things and we haven't really seen that we've seen it like go after the big you know rich corporations you know because they you know, they're not paying taxes. So where are they going to come up with the money for a, a, a crisis? I mean, we, we've seen that, but this is different. So we could have that balance, but COVID still is a risk factor until we get it contained. And we can't get it contained if we have a significant part of the population that refuses to get uh, immune from it. And the only way you get immune from it, you know, you either have it or you get the vaccine. We have people like, you know, i am got my gun, but I'm not taking the vaccine. Well, this, the I'm going to take the other side of that coin, which is as we do increase the um the immunity and as the numbers economic data i mean the retail spending etc cetera, etc cetera, we just got today i mean year over year and month over month they actually increase the likelihood that the fed should tighten yeah so the market will start to I'm price actually that less, i'm less worried about the fed tightening and when that happens because i don't think it's going to be as much as people are worried about i don't think it's going to be as soon as people are worried about and i think it's because they you're gonna to have to sit back and 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 watch because the, again, the disconnect is how, you know, we're expecting it to happen at, at, at this point. And if it happens further than that, what is the ramifications? And that's not being priced appropriately. And so- they don't know. <laughs> exactly. But there's reason why, you know, there's, there's more reason to think that it could be later than we hoped than sooner than we hoped. So, you know, that's what I'm concerned about. But until we have, I mean, we've really got a dichotomy of the people that have been in the market. I mean, remember this time last year, we were talking about the $4 trillion, $5 trillion on the sidelines, it's ready to go. I mean, th that, that, those people weren't vulnerable during, you know, an economic collapse with uh, COVID and they weren't getting devastated. And they were, you know, the kinds of people that like, you know, you give people $15 an hour, they won't even worry. I mean, you're wearing a, a suit that costs more than $1,200 a month, which is what you'd make if you earn $15 an hour and we're able to work full time. So there's this this not real real understanding of reality there but i, I don't know i'm i'm less worried about what the i, I think the fed's going to be more watchful and you know i mean so the money but the money is there whether whether the fed does it or not there's already so much cash correct available so to this, and to this keep is the, higher. the invisible hand with the liquidity um, flowing and any calamity just is solved by liquidity again printed but the um kind of going back to like the the tesla cult uh stock with celebrity ceo and then incredible speculation that, that can drive you know particular sector rotations into the esg or ev moment uh, uh, electrification and ev vehicles to the spac um issuance which was unprecedented 98 billion, I, think now. I think it's 98 billion versus 80 something billion it's last year in, already. and i've done two spac webinars you know interview series on this it's been fabulous for traders and this, mm -hmm. you know, millennial, um, you know, cadre of, of traders coming in that are just the next hottest, best thing. We haven't even talked about Bitcoin and specifically Bitcoin on Tesla's balance sheet. What's yeah. your position on that? Uh, I'm not a fan. I'll just. <laughs> I didn't that's, expect that's you just, to be. Absolutely. You know, they spent all the money they collected on energy credit. That's arrogance. Okay. It's not just irresponsible. It's arrogance. And the only way that they were able to make any, you know, to report a profit was those oh, that. credits. And this is a company, you know, we can go ahead and move into the, the Tesla versus Valiant kind of a deal. I'd love to, because that, okay. that, that tweaks because my this, interest. You know, again, 
Yeah. Right. Because, you know, a lot of the, you couldn't get any more opposite from technical analysis, you know, trading than credit analysis, because, you know, we're back over here going, oh yeah, <laughs> really? We'll see about that because uh, I'm telling you that that's kind of a difference. So, um, all right. So yours from an investment standpoint, because my my tune, just so you know, obviously, I love to study what makes something move. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, option flow for me has been huge in the, the whole t it drives the market. I mean, th right. this is still an absolutely it's not just option flow, but the hap what's happening, having to happen on the other side of that trade when the market makers have to go buy and sell huge chunks of the underlying this right, that's true. Those, that's a huge mechanism that I don't think people are really um, grasping. This no, part. or it's waiting in the ARC ETF, it's waiting, etc. Yeah. So, but until that happens right now, there is still this unprecedented uh, volume that goes in daily to Tesla, which well, is here's one thing that happens worse the indices, right? Well, here's one thing that happens though with credit analysis because. It comes at it with, and you can share. By the way, screen. I gave you power. If you want to, if there's anything oh, you want I, to share, you know what? I didn't load anything up. I didn't know that, that you were going to. No do worries. That. I didn't load anything up, so I've got everything now loaded on this on my other screen. But no worries. Um, so the different. It's kind of like uh, first of all, the problem with Tesla is that it's not, you know, and, and you have to. We should be asking hard, hard questions for a company with a seven hundred billion dollar market cap, multiple, you know zillion multiple of really in, you know non-existent earnings i mean we should be asking hard questions even if you love it you know they, if we're really responsible managing our portfolios we should be asking every single day why should i own this why should i continue to own this i mean if i there's no such thing as a whole there's a buy or a sell if i still own it today i bought it again today i'm still i'm still there with my thesis and so the problem with tesla is that after 18 years it still eliminates stand. It's not making money on lemonade. Let me like, for example, say I've got a lemonade stand up out in the yard and I make a really cool lemonade. I mean, if there's sparkles in it, there's unicorns floating around. It's gorgeous. It's the future of lemonade and it's wonderful. And after 18 years, I'm still not making any money. I can't make any profit on my lemonade. Can't do it. Still haven't. So every quarter, my mom's friends come around and I'm sitting at my little table with my lemonade and they come and buy a chair for me. So that every quarter I could say, hey, made some money, got some money. I made money on chairs, but I'm in the business of making lemonade. And we won't even talk about, you know, the problems are also the developing the lemonade, like a cup of catch on fire while it's sitting there or, you know, whatever. I'm not going to, you know, I mean, there's other issues, but that's. And there the are a lot of lemonade stands right now. There's a lot of, it's up just, like exactly. Daisy. Other people are popping up their own lemonade stands now. So I'm no longer the new lemonade stand. In fact, my lemonade formulation you know, really is the same thing I started my new back in 2016. So that's the problem with Tesla. And so the problem is that these problems, they had a chance to get past all this for years. You can find a company more indulged than Tesla. And it's in a wonderful in industry. I love the EV industry. People are like, well, you're just a hate. No, I am such a tree hugger. Oh my God. I just <laughs> love green. I've been there long, been there, done that. I've been, in fact, I own Tesla stock myself for years. You know, made, you know, made it. I finally sold it myself though in 2017. And it wasn't because I no longer believed in Tesla's, the future of EV. I could not, I could not, uh, I could not stay, I couldn't take Elon Musk's management. He's a reckless, unscrupulous CEO. And you cannot, that's a, that's an unknown quantity. You can't, you can't put a number on that and you and can't, that it. destroys value. And there, and it, again, you know, you, and you can, if you can't trust the balance sheet and the income statement, you can't trust their prospects and you can't trust their, um, you know, their forecasts and you can't trust to boast about all these things that's going to happen. And you have, you know, a bad management doesn't just show up in making ugly tweets, you know, even though they're there, but it also shows up in unsafe working conditions at all their plants and, you know, by a, multiples, but compared to all the other major car makers combined. You have the cars are poorly made and they're they're they get all of the bad ratings from you know you know consumer reports and jd powers and you have um terrible customer service you know that's a problem and you have um in fact even china has cracked down harder on tesla than the united states has and all that's about to change because we have a new administration that's now going to populate all these agencies with actual heads of agencies no provisional head actual people that you know will run the agency the agencies have been gutted while they're hiring 
So all of these things that, you know, that's been skidding for corporations the last one, that's changing. I mean, kessa has got 27 investigations into their products. So, I mean, to, to cars for crashes where people died and injured. So that's, these are more risks and they're all piling up. And so the problem is with the equity just kind of discounting all this and blowing that all off for indefinitely is that these are problems that affected the credit analysis and they affected the bond prices and they were there and they were reflected there accordingly. And, you know, the equity might not want to look at it, but then eventually those things, if they're real concerns and Tesla doesn't address them, they stay. And others around them, their, their peer group does not experience those problems. They don't have, um, they, they don't have to share those costs because they're not doing it the same way. They, they run safer plants. They make safer cars. They make uh, better quality cars. All these kinds of things affect demand, affect the price, affect the market conditions. And Tesla's losing ground at a time that they should have been, they should have been behind all that. I mean, they're not a scrappy little newcomer anymore, you know, and, and make it, a, you know, invent, they've been building cars at commercial scale since 2016. They've been building cars at commercial scale overseas for longer than that. And they've just grown more than that. And they haven't, they haven't solved all these problems. So when you look at getting back on to just kind of launching into the, how Tesla and Valiant Pharmaceuticals, for example, two all found pharmaceuticals was a market darling also led by a CEO that proclaimed himself as most brilliant. Everyone else in the industry is stupid. Only I know how to run the pharmaceutical industry. And this is this was that guy, Mark Michael Pierce. So um, the similarity is, is that the problems I saw with Tesla, and if you could come at it as a credit analyst, okay? Credit analyst, I care about quality of revenue, quality of earnings, cash earnings, where they came from, um, quality of cash flow, what's actually being generated and where it's coming from. And what are their actual obligations? CapEx, real CapEx, not just, you know, growth CapEx, maintenance CapEx, as well as debt, debt service, as well as leases. And so I care about that they're piling up leases and what they're using the leases for and how they're funding, what are they funding with those leases as well as the debt? And so how are they running their operation? And because the idea, again, with a credit market is that unlike stock, Bonds mature. So you have a time limit. So is the company, and I love the marginal world, right? They're, they're troubled. They're junk bond for a reason. Can they grow out of this problem? You know, I mean, it's not that we don't touch them, but, you know, do they have a, do they have a plan? Are they on their way? Are they making progress? Can they, can I see it's better from there, you know, going forward than here? And so Valium or Pharmaceuticals, a problem I had with them, as I told you that, you know, I'd study, I'd follow them for 20 years. They were a serial acquirer. J. Michael Pearson joined the company in 2008. He had never run as, he'd never been a CEO before ever. And they hired him as CEO. He was a big shot uh, and, uh, consultant for McKinsey. And so McKinsey um, is famous for uh, the guy from uh, Enron came from McKinsey too, same thing. But uh, I know more than you, you know, just in fact, I'm so complicated and, and advanced. Don't even try to, don't even question me. And he was like that. And his idea was that the whole entire pharmaceutical industry is stupid because there's no one should be spending money in finding new drugs. We have enough drugs out here. We should be buying up drug companies that already found the drugs and fire everybody, jack the prices on the drugs a billion percent and, you know, boom, instant profit. And we continue that until the market will no longer uh, support our pricing. And then you go buy somebody else. So they were a serial acquirer. And Michael Pearson was little more than a carnival barker. You know, he was just, you know, here's what it is and going on. And the market was, you know, woo, they're making money. And the implications here are that they just proclaimed and the market accepted that healthcare now is not in the business of curing people. You know, how quaint. We're in the business of making money, as much money as we can, as fast as we can, and we keep on going. That's what we're here to do, folks, aren't we? Am I right? Am I right? And, you know, yes. And so the market was buying up their stock and they were just a darling. And I was like, problem with that is the carousel is you got to keep the carousel going because, you know, it will slow down on its own. And Valiant by 2014 was already having that problem. They just bought Bash and Lom, And that was the biggest thing they bought today. And it was kind of an unremarkable asset to buy in the first place. And they were, they did the same thing. And they tried to squeeze out the profits and jack the prices and, and they were less able to do that. And they'd run, kind of run their course. They'd bought BioVail, they'd bought some other things and they were running out of gas. And the problem is by that time, it was already to the point where you watch how uh, margins, volumes, a year hence when they would make an acquisition, 
they couldn't sustain it. The mm. volumes would fall. They were already running GE right now too. They're, they're already running. They're already burning through market sentiment in you know the, in the in the you know consumer markets, and insurance companies were getting you know huh, you know getting wary about them. And so it was like a year. Well, by the time they in spring of 2014, they were going to go by Allergan. And by that time, Bash and Lom, it looked to me, I already mapped it out that they were going to, it was going to be less than two quarters out and you're going to have falling safe store sales. And so they'd already burned their, they already burned the bridge with Bash and Lom, which wasn't, you know, and they overpay for everything. So yay them. And they bought it all with high yield debt. So woo, they're bloated with debt with an eroding, a constantly eroding, you know, same, you know, run rate business model. And they, they just got to keep buying, keep buying more and more expensive. And so they went after Allergan. So Allergan at the time was investment grade and it was run by David Pyatt. And I don't gush over, over management and CEO generally. They're, they're doing the job. They're not doing the job. But few are really worth merit. But Bal David Pyatt was, he was, he was a real deal. Because one thing in the drug world is that not only is it hard really hard to find good drugs and bring them to market successfully and profitably. He was good at doing that. Most of the time it's hard to find. He was good at cherry picking which compound's going to work. And, you know, I mean, by Allegan, that, that was the vial that Allegan he built and they were good at what they did. And they, they made reasonable price increases, but they weren't gouging the market like, like Valiant was doing, like the market would turn to like, look at these guys. Why aren't you gouging? We want gougers. And Allegan was not. So clearly there's an opportunity to be had here, right? We need to buy a gal, Allergan and gut it, you know, and, you know, and it'll die on the vine and all these wonderful, you know, pipeline that they were buying all the kind of, all they'd be just, and I was like, oh, hell no. I just, that was the line in the sand for me. I'm like, well, I'll get back into a Valiant, which, you know, whatever with a, no, this is a sell. They're going to, I don't think the, I don't think Allergan, I don't think the deal is going to go through because they can't afford to buy it. I don't think if they did buy it, that it would, they would get the synergies that they're claiming, all the things that that you're doing there. But um, even then, while the market was like, oh, no, we love it. We love it. And Bill Ackman, enough said, um, I was already seeing that value was already running out of time because the deal was taking longer to get done than they should. And so sure enough, here comes the eroding same store sales. Here comes um, every month, every quarter, they throw up a chart like here's our top sellers. They don't tell you Initially, it would be all over the map. Like, there's not even, there's not numbers here. Okay. So, this, they got them ranked, but is that growth or revenue? Or how, what, are, what, are, what are these numbers? You know, you just wrote the names of the drug. And every quarter, there'd be a different list. Like, it's a moving target. It's like, what happened? What happened? So, you couldn't do a quarter, quarter, much less a year over year comparison. So, when you're playing with comps and suddenly that, you know, an obscure drug just shows up out of the blue and then disappears, what's going on? So they're planning what there's something going on with sales other than just we threw them out there, we made a bunch of money, and then it went away. It was just something weird going on with what they were doing with sales. And then they were a year that continued a year. The Allergan deal fell through, but um, and then they were desperate to go buy something even more desperate. And the desperation exhibited itself that they decided, well, we're going to start making drugs now and we're going to start selling drugs. And so, you know, that we come up, we have a pipeline, we could be a drug company. I'm like, no, they were bad at it. And the two pinnacle companies that came to mind were one was a uh, female uh, sexual, you know, like a female Viagra they kept calling was Addie. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. I called a snake oil in my report. Okay. So it was like, um, it was, you know, really, really expensive to do this. And really, all you need is a glass of wine and you would have more, you know, more effectiveness than Addy. It was ridiculous. And they went out and pay a billion dollars for that. The, like within 24 hours after finally getting FDA approval and FDA had turned it down for years and finally approved it with the caveat that we don't know why it works. So, you know, you're on your own. And they gave it approval. And uh, no guys killing anybody. So, okay. And they paid a billion dollars for that pig. And that was on top of the other pig they had, which was a toenail fungus thing. I think it was called Jublia. And it was $8,000 to treat toenail fungus over like nine weeks. And Mayo Clinic and researcher had put a report out saying like a, a jar of Vicks vapor rub has more effective than Jublia, you know, these kinds of things. So I'm like, okay, so this is desperation, right? So they're not generating same store sales. Prop margins are eroding, cash flow shrinking. Right. They've run through all of their, you know, their banks, their banks are now resident and don't want to loan them any more money. They have to do something 
you know, big. And so I wrote in my reports, I remember that like, you know, this is like in physics, you have a black, long before they could prove definitively that there were black holes, here they are, the, the math showed they were there. They, the math pointed to it. And, and I'm like, there's, there's something going on here with, you know, with, and I pointed out with, with their product line, with it, is it channel stuffing or whatever, formulators were actually saying, we're not going to sell valiant drugs. And yet they still keep coming up. Why are these things, who's buying these things? Why is this happening? Well, um, like I said, in the bonds, believe me, we, we in the bond world, we were like, oh, and the bonds are getting going down steadily, 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 but the box like stocks, like, you know, we don't care. We love it. Woo. Until the summer. And, uh, you know, Roddy Boyd, and John Hempton found out that they'd created this bogus pharmacy that was able to kind of get around the gatekeepers at the insurance companies and so on and so forth. And that's where they're shoving all this inventory. And it was like, you know, fake and blow up. And that kind of was now. So that's where a case where it took a long time to be true, but it was true the whole time. So from the, the market a long time to be true, but it was true the whole time, true the whole time. Jeez, and yeah. the market, those of us in the market that were, if you look at, you know, the bond market, we're creditors. We're not equity. We're creditors. We are loaning you banks. So if I'm loaning you money, I do care. If you want to buy a house, I care that you don't have a job, but you're able to make money, you know, like gigs. You know, I came up with, you know, my fence, he gave me a good price this time or whatever. You know, I mean, that's not sustained income, right? That's not sustained profits. That's not sustained. These are not things that you can project. I'm making them reliably now and can continue to do that in the future. So that's the case that it happened with Valiant and the truth came out and so on and so forth. So wow, the parallels, they, they smell strong. <laughs> they smell strong. So here's what we have at Tesla. Here's look, here, when I keep focusing on these things, mm -hmm. Tesla, again, after 18 years, no matter how many billions of dollars that they generate in revenue, they still can't make money unless they come up with every quarter, a few hundred million sales from credit, uh, ener energy credits or you know, tinkering with reserves or deferred revenue, just come up with, you know, like a Hail Mary at the end, they've got to do that no matter how many units, no matter how many. And meanwhile, so, you know, I set that aside. I carved that out. What are the operations doing? And I noted back in 2018, when the Model 3, Model 3 was their big deal. That's the flagship. And it, it was finally launched at scale in the middle, in the summer of 2018, in the June quarter. In fact, the last week, that was the big thing. They finally got 5,000 done in a week, produced in a week. Because the whole problem is they can't make them fast enough. They finally got it 5,000 a week. Of course, 4,100 of those had to be reworked, literally. They couldn't sell them. But anyway, nevertheless, they hit the number. They hit the number. I noticed that at the end of this, the last quarter in 2018, they had excess inventory. Now, that, had, that was a problem to me. How do you have excess inventory in Model 3 if you can't sell them fast enough? You can't make them fast enough. So that's, you know, inconsistency. And sure enough, I noticed that going forward in the next, the next quarter was actually a disappointing quarter. But as it turned out, the peak for U.S. sales of Model 3 was the last half of 2018. They have never achieved that number again, the peak sales that they did in, 20, in 2018 on Model 3 in the U.S., Tesla needs to complete continuously add incremental sales from some source. So if it's, you know, and, and sure enough, and the first thing also, this next thing was that they had maintained that when Model 3 comes out, we will, you know, there's still, you know, hot demand for Model S and X, and they will continue to sell straight, you know, sell strongly with Model 3. And so Model 3 will be incremental, not cannibalizing. Well, that didn't happen. In fact, you can look at charts that I've posted in several reports and I've updated this report at, you know, several quarters that Model 3, uh, you know, when it came out that, you know, and that was the end of the, you know, the long, strong run of Model S next. That was it. They started their long decline. And this is mirrored in Europe. So when we see it in the U.S. It has been mirrored in Europe. So that that's something interesting to watch. So sure enough, when you go across overseas, then that Model 3 was sent over to Europe. But then it, a year Hence, Model 3 sales in Europe started to fall. So I was wondering what would happen in China because the incremental was when U.S. sales were fading, that was the line was blurred because, whoa, we're sending them to Europe now. We're sending them to China now. Okay, that's how it's going to be. Except there's weakness has already become apparent because Model 3 was already fading in Europe. And by the end of the year, you know, last year, they didn't even have, um, you know, they stopped getting the... Uh, Let's see. 
the subsidy, the government subsidy in Europe. They're not, they don't qualify that, qualify for that anymore in Europe. And what was also happening is Europe were getting really, a lot of really strong competitors were finally delivering their newest mm -hmm. models mm -hmm. in size and scale. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of these are like, well, you know, they're still selling more than the take hand and models, whatever. Well, the take, they sold 20,000. That's all they made. You couldn't buy anymore. If they had more, they probably would have sold them. And that's the luxury end. And they, I mean, there's that kind of thing. So then in China, I noticed last year by October, they were already fading month to month in model three in October, they were dropping. And then in October, China said, you know, boom, we've got to have a new, you know, a new push, another uh, benefit for EV sales. It was, a, you know, an expanding the territory, we could only have drive EVs. Well, they helped all EVs, not just Tesla, but it was enough to bump them about 20,000 cars at the fourth quarter to make them have the number. Otherwise, they would have been substantially lower in, you know, in deliveries. That was their Hail Mary there. So what's going on? We don't know what's happening this quarter. They were able to pull it out. We don't know why that happened. We know that Model Y, which by the way is three, four, 70%, the same thing as Model 3. So the problems you have with Model 3 have been migrated over to Model Y, plus it has its own kind of issues. Um, Model Y has just been introduced into China. And even before the first car rolled out, they had to drop the price by 30% on the Model Y in China. And that's to get them sold. And then, you know, because it had a poor launch and then it kind of jumped up in the last, in the most recent month that we've been able to see, but it did it at the expense of Model 3. So it looks like the same thing is happening. And that's the problem. If you're not able to sustain sales after the new, like it's all, you know, two things happening. One, your big pent up demand is less than it was before in prior launches of different things. And two, that, that big honeymoon, that doesn't last as long. And that's the concern. So sustainable sales is what I've been watching in Tesla. And, and you can see, I've got it lined up. Like, you know, here's, you know, here's the old one. Here's the new one. Uh-oh, red, 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 red. Now I got blue, green, green, green. Up, oh, red, 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 red. And you see it holding out. And there's a reason why as soon as Tesla started you know, launched the Model Y, it immediately merged it with Model S. So you could no longer, I mean, Model 3, you could no longer break that number out. So you couldn't see that cannibalization happening right away because initially it was launched only in the U.S. So if it, you know, that would have been, at, and that was at the expense of Model 3. And so that's not sustained demand. That's not insane demand. That's not like, and also they make multiple, you know, price cuts every single quarter. They have to, other, you, know, you don't cut the price if you've got people, you know, happy to fork it out, no matter what it costs. And they have to do that each time. And now we're met, we're anniversarying, you know, two years of significant price cuts. So quality of revenue is a problem with Tesla. So quality of earnings, quality of earnings is huge because this is your ability to pay back, to service your debt, to service your leases. I'm a credit analyst. So all of that Free money I just dropped in from credit, you know, emission sales that drops straight to, to the profit lines. So, but if you're analyzing what their earnings are actually doing without that, you carve that out. And if you look at EBITDA, um, you know, the EBITDA, let's see, they reported, you know, 5.8 billion in EBITDA last year, 1.6, 1 1.8 billion of that was energy credits. Okay. That's a, you know, that's huge. You have, they also started adding back. That they're going to be uh, losing over yeah. time. Over time. Yeah. Um, but they also started adding back at the end of 2019, they started adding back um, stock based compensation. And I have a real problem with stock based compensation. People like automatically just cut it off because it's stock. No, it is your, it's in your, you've claimed that as your uh, SGNA. You've claimed that as your salaries cost. If I give it to you in cash or I give it to you in stock, you know, I get a, I get an income tax, you know, benefit and, you know, tax benefit, but, it's, but from the purposes of calculating what does it cost for me to maintain my, to keep my employees, that I consider that a cost. So I don't add back, you know, I mean, I don't let them, you know, add back SGN. I mean, uh, in my numbers, I don't let them add, but I don't add back uh, stock-based compensation. And when you do that, it's not much of it. <laughs> billion, if you just take out gap EBITDA, not all the funnies and the happy happy things. If you just take gap EBITDA, which was 4.3 billion in not 5.8 billion, 4.3 billion in 20 uh, last year, gap EBITDA drops to 2.4 billion. Okay, so half. I half. 
And so if you take the reported number and you take out the energy credits and, and deferred, you know, reserves and the other little tinkerings, they were smaller, but not as significant as the energy credits with that. But anyway, you do all that and you take out stock pay compensation. That EBITDA number comes out, which is your actual cash number if you're not, you know, if you're actually, you know, what is your actual cash number from your operations? 2.3 billion. Now, if you're a credit analyst, that means that, that uh, your leverage at the end of the year not 2.3 times, which SAP was like, you know, it's 2.3 times now. You know, we're going to we're going to increase their credit quality rating two days ahead of adding them to the S&P 500. No, purely a coincidence at that. But it's not 2.3 times. It's, six, it's closer to six times. Now it looks more like closer to the low end, you know, triple C, you know, double B minus name that, you know, that I think it is. And that's that's meaningful. That matters. So let's. Let's proceed. So that's, but that's, you know, if you're able to whack off in, by redefining how you calculate EBITDA and suddenly you've got, you know, 2.3 times leverage, you know, yay you. But if you're, if you're looking at, if you're from my standpoint, I care how you generated those numbers. I cared how much of those numbers actually came from what you do for a living. That doesn't tell me that you have a sustainable business model that can service your obligation. Mm -hmm. So let's move to a 900 on. billion market cap. Yeah. <laughs> so let's keep going. So we look at, um, so you've got now um, the cash flow. All those things also happen to cash flow. And you take all those numbers out. Plus, here's another thing. Tesla, they, they raised $12 billion in selling stock last year. They also continue to borrow also. They borrowed every single quarter and added leases. They're using leases to fund part of their cash flow. I mean, part of their CapEx, not just cash. Their, their, their accounts receivable remains elevated in a business where it's like you come in and I give you a car and you give, you give me cash and I give you a car. But they're elevated you know, accounts receivable, which most quarters grows faster than revenue in a cash business. And you have their payables continue to be you know, extended. Their, their payables, they, they continue to keep uh, extending payables. Why is that? If you've got, at the end of the year, $19 billion reported in cash. And this has been, Tesla's done this the whole time. But if you have back at Vicky World, where I'm concerned, they're actually not generating profit. They're actually not generating cash. And every single penny on their balance sheet that they've ever had is comes from borrowing and selling stock as a result. And now they have $19 billion. But six, close to $7 billion of that is actually held overseas. And guess what? They're Chinese lenders are much more stringent than the American, you know, investor. They're like, you know, we're fine over here. But over there, the Chinese is, you know, for one thing, it was lot, took them a lot longer to get their lending, to get their plant built. Um, but they restrict how they can use that cash and how much they can keep that cash, how much of the cash they have to keep on hand and how much they can, and what they can spend it on. So they really, they don't have unencumbered availability of that cash. And they also have like nearly, you know, 800 million in cash on the balance sheet from, Customer deposits, they can't spend that cash. They owe people that. People have put deposits down for cars to come at some point. So they can't spend that. So if you rip out what they actually can't spend freely, it's down, it's really closer to 11 billion. And that's little change from the previous quarter, it's even though they made 11 billion. 11 and that's uh, similarly a little change from the previous, from the third quarter. And they made, you know, billions more in profit, I mean, revenue. So, you know, they're, that's another confirmation that they're not generating cash. But what are they doing with this cash? So if you're worried about your 2021 prospects, regardless of what you're saying, you know, telling investors, if you actually are worried about your 2021 prospects and you've got, you know, all these plans to build plants around, but your, your cars are really not selling as fast as you think, and you're building more capacity that maybe you're possibly going to be building excess capacity before even, you know, you get into Europe, for example, um, you're going to need some cash. You're going to need some cash to balance out. That's another reason why, I, you know, to hide you over. So if you're a credit investor, you're going to be wary of that just to see how all this plays out. Because what I'm concerned about is that the second half of this year, um, the first half of the year is you know, mapped with COVID first half last year. So, you know, yep. yay us. But the second half of this year, there's a lot of expectations in what Tesla's supposed to generate in units and, and everything. If they don't meet those, then you can have um, if the market sentiment it could turn against them, it'll be more expensive to then raise cash, which maybe they're still not raising cash, generating cash yet. You know, if their sales are not as strong and they still don't have margins there yet, 
they could be still losing money by the end of this year. So, um, and, you know, facing much more market pressure. So there's a lot of reason to not be enthusiastic there. And if you're a bond holder, you're probably, I would be gauging that if I'm right and these are real risk facing, I'd be thinking I want to refinance those bonds. And if I don't refinance those bonds, those bonds are trading in the market at 104, you're not going to get paid that if you, you know, you'll lose, you know, you'll lose money if you're an investor now and they decide to refinance the bonds. But that's what I'd be doing if I was Tesla. I'd refinance those bonds and push it, push it out, you know, 10 years. So anyway, but and see how I'm coming at a whole different reason. Totally. totally. And we already talked about why that, you know, they've been running insurance for years and still can't make a penny, why it's not going to make sense that they're going to be that's going to be the turn pivot point or all these other things. But that's oh, why I'm looking at it and I'm like, you know, I'm still, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. You no, know, no, clearly. Yeah. And, and Peter is saying is such astute common sense from Vicky. Absolutely. <laughs> but Thomas is asking, okay, because I'm just seeing his, his comment here or question at current equity valuation, you know, they should raise cash by new issue. Why don't they? Okay. Raising cash by new issue. For one thing, people forget, um, that raised selling stock is the most expensive thing you can do. The cheapest thing you can do in your capital structure is to borrow, okay? And they've already borrowed and have already, you know, I've, they could sell stock. They could definitely sell stock, but you're also gonna be concerned, you know, and people clearly willing to buy it, but from its, you know, pricing standpoint, it's then be much cheaper for them just to refinance the bonds and to sit tight on cash they've already borrowed. And also if I'm right, They've already been, as far as I'm concerned, done it a couple of times where they raised money right after something really materially ooky happened and they should have, they knew about it and didn't tell people that they were about to do a stock raise in two weeks or something. Um, if they've got serious trouble and they don't disclose it and they sell stock, then, you know, you've got some disclosure. And by the way, Jake, Jay, uh, you know, our brother Jay that was heading to SEC, who used to be Bill Ackman's lawyer and Volkswagen's lawyer during the Valiant Pharmaceutical that became the head of the SEC, he didn't, he's not there anymore. So when we have SEC problems now, we're going to have SEC problems. Yeah. And SEC is already, by the way, looking at SPACs. So, you know, you yeah, and I, I saw that about, too. You know, that's going to be like, oh, we want you to disclose things and we want you to have uh, accurate projections. In fact, you're like, oh, wait a minute, that wasn't in the fine print. So, you know, they're, they're, they 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 can have liability if they've got problems and they have uh, serious issues and, and, and erosion in their business model and they don't disclose it and they raise, and they sell people's stock because they can. So, like I said, the, again, they're already, you know, the cheapest thing they could do is to keep borrowing. And, you know, I, I, they could be able to, if they're claiming 2.3 times leverage, they could sell, they could raise more bonds. You know, S&P says they're close to investment grade. So um, why don't do that? And that was management by committee, right? It was an S&P committee that said they can come in. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I mean, the S&P did allowed them to, uh, the S&P did when they reevaluated their um, EBITDA, they did take out the energy credits, but they allowed them to keep the uh, stock-based comp so that they still show low, leverage and they're not really looking at they don't really care about their leases and they don't care that they're funding capex with i care what they're doing with cash i care not just where the cash came from but where is it going what are you pledged to and why aren't you paying your bills on time and why are you collecting up cash and accounts receivable where is that coming from i care about all these things that are happening with cash going in and out and i care that when you're looking at the income statement that's not where cash is coming from all right, so this I have to ask because your, uh, you know, your forensic accounting and and credit analysis is stellar, and obviously this is something that will play out when there's disappointment, when there's a, a, a maybe a strong regime change. What do you think the triggers would be to actually uh, kind of reveal? And, and unearth, if you will, the real well, I think there, uh, I think it'll be chipping away. Like, we'll, we'll, let's see okay. what happens this quarter. Okay, so we got, we came up with somehow, You're you know, 20,000 20, more car. <laughs> well, 20,000 more, well, I mean, each quarter, it's gonna be what's what's delivered versus expectations and the gravity of where it is. Okay. And so everybody's giving everybody a pass for the first half of this year, but, <clears throat> excuse me, you've got, um, we got 20,000 more cars than, than we all, than we thought they were going to get again, kind of the same number that we had in the fourth quarter last year. That's, you know, maybe a coincidence, but so, it's bad. That, so you should be making proportionally much more, you know, they should be making a profit at some point. Okay. So my number is I've got them at 
roughly, you know, 10 billion ish, you know, revenue and one point near 1.8 billion in EBITDA. And I think they're going to have like 200 million in net income reported numbers, uh, including like say three or 400 million in energy credits and other unusual uh, non-operating items. That's my number. That's what I'm looking for okay. um, based on the delivery numbers that they reported. And so they, it's going to be, you know, the number that I think people, people are going to have to start looking at. I think people will start looking at them because Tesla's not the only game in town. And okay. So Tesla's real expensive. This is true. So then you have also to take the other side of this trade because we have to lawyer this out, the bull and bear case. Sure. Um, ARC ETF holding is very large in Tesla, eight and a half percent waiting. Last time I checked, I believe. She's selling though. She sold, she's selling some. Selling some, but it's still a big waiting. So the question, you know, of, of her networking effects uh, of Tesla and $3,000 price target have you looked at that rigorously to see where she comes up with this three thousand dollar price target? Like, I'm sure there are holes you could poke into it, but what? Yeah, well, I, what I don't do want to. I don't like her. exactly, and I don't like to trash other people's work. You know, exactly. we don't have so you know, with anybody. But I'll just say that it 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 doesn't take a rigorous look to see problems with their modeling and their. Um, and What's the biggest one? The biggest problem, and and honestly, the one thing that could drive it. How know. much their earnings are worth, and where, and the source of their earnings, where their their battery business. I have a whole report that I wrote, for example, breaking out each one of Tesla's uh, business businesses and mapping that versus other peers that are already doing that, you know, at least as well, if not better. And you know, if you look at the other battery makers, the other you know, solar energy providers, the other car makers, though, if you, you know, map it out, those, mar the multiples don't, don't they don't, <laughs> you, Tesla doesn't have enough advantage to, to answer those multiples, even the battery business. If people were listening very, very closely, they have a proof of concept is what they announced. Proof of concept could stop cold at proof of concept, or it could go further and stop. There's many, many steps in many years Elon Musk is quoted himself, I think 2015, 2016, getting from proof of concept to the commercial is years away. And why he was, he was, people were like asking him why they hadn't done this or that. He goes, yeah, I looked at that, you know, pshaw. And so um, you can't, the battery business is like the holy grail. And there are so many other really strong players in the battery business who's going to have the and there's next... also a lot of restriction on supply at the commodity level as well yeah well we're looking at that's a near term that thing right there's a lot of bottlenecks everything that's near term right i mean i'm, I'm looking like you know two three years out when supposedly these batteries it. these brand new batteries are going to come out um the entire you know i mean it toyota comes up with a solid state that you know is equally you know and less volatile and, and similar if not better range and so on and so forth you know boom end of story you don't need to mess with lithium ion. i mean it's little thing it i mean I'm, I'm not saying i have a whole nother you know i've got a whole nother direction on it because that's techie fun stuff I, I i like i like doing that i was live tweeting during the battery thing ah but it has you know where's the free you know the heat you know dissipated from da 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 da, da. that's what it, you know anyway that's a whole nother thing but they could come when you model each one the end you, of a tailpipe to solve decarbonization that would lower the you know the whole but they, exactly there's so many ways but yeah. anyway if you just looking at each one of the businesses you know for one mapping it versus what the market says these other kinds of businesses are worth it's not even i mean it's not like they're within range or a little better because we just love tessa and they're pretty and they have the sparkly lemonade but it's it's that it's like you know ir irrational you're, you're, it's irrationally high on every one on every one of these different businesses without an equally at least rational reason for why these others then aren't worth more. So you know, it, you know, it's not just that Tesla is the only one, and, and when Tesla buys all these, you can't. It, it's not doing it in, in a vacuum. If Tesla's going to sell all these cars, well, it's losing market share in all of its markets. All of its markets, it's losing market share. You know, these other cars aren't just you know, growing the market, like Tesla's like, you know, they're, they're losing ground versus these other companies. So there is some finite level of demand, you know, uh, that's for, for the cars. I mean, it's growing. And my conviction is that the more people learn that when they buy EVs, it's not just buying an EV and then I guess, whoa, it is quiet. And then, you know, it's living with an EV because it's cheaper to own. It's cheaper to maintain. They don't have a bunch of things that break on it. You know, they don't have, you know, you don't have to fill up all the fluids, you know, and, and it's just, 
it's just easier. So I think over time, EVs will be more, but it's, it, it is going to be over time. But uh, we're not paying for that. We've already paid Tesla, you know, 700, market, 700 billion right now, market cap. Boom. Where do you go from there? We should be asking these really hard questions. And if Tesla is indeed, you know, it's not the leading edge in all of these areas anymore. It's actually not. And LiDAR is not dumb and all these kinds of things that, you know, that people just want to like, la, 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 I'm not listening. Well, you need to. You need to listen and you should be questioning. And if you can't, if you love Tesla, love, love, love it, but you still can't answer why. And you don't, so you don't want to hear, well, is that a strategy or is that just, you know, leave me alone. You're a hater. No, that's not a strategy. Are, are there any other companies with the same extreme irrational kind of behavior and that doesn't, that doesn't justify the fundamentals that you can oh, think of? Sure. You know, all the SPACs. Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. You know, so if you go to the SPAC, because if you're WeWork, for example, like I said, I've got a SPAC report I'm about to put out. But I mean, I wrote out, I mean, when WeWork came out and it was $47 million, I, I, I penciled out in my first report, you know what? You know what? It's worth $5 billion at best. And that's if it doesn't, uh, if the IPO doesn't fall through. And I think the IPO is going to fall through. And if it does, it's going to run out of cash by the fall. And that's what happened. And But- um, if you're like SPACs, because, you know, IPOs are so picky, you have to have so much information. And, you know, I like SPACs. Well, an investor should be going, oh, run away bravely. Okay. Because I, I already have a problem with the disclosure for the problem for companies as it is. There's not, things are not being disclosed accurately. They're not being disclosed timely. There's things that are left out altogether. There's things that are, you know, misrepresented. We have too much occasion for that. We don't need to invite an entire another asset class where that's like, okay, you know, here, but they, did a really cool access, they did give access to a whole bunch of retail traders that yeah. then obviously love. Well, but you could say that, it's, but you could say that that's way we redefined a lot of things. We redefined yeah. the investor, the, the personal consumer, has not had a pay raise in decades. So what? how do we have increasing, everybody going to the moon profits because keep the, we didn't make those consumers better off. We facilitated more ways for them to continue to buy. So it's where I true. used to have a 48 month car note, I now have an 84 month car note and now I can't afford that. So I can lease even longer and I can't afford that. I could subscribe to a car. So the end result is that cars keep selling, you know, it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the other side is really, is demand really healthy? Do, is this a sustainable consumer? Um, where are we going with this? And it's not just that industry. I'm just using that as an example. So if you have SPACs, we just figured out a way where we can let you buy more. Um, does that mean it's a better product? Does that mean it's going to attract really sophisticated investors that know what they're doing and really understand what they're buying? And are we okay with that? If we don't, you know, if I just don't get caught or you just can't nail me for anything because there's not exactly a rag on and that. There are a lot of SPACs to chase and they have limited, sure. you know, focus. Sure what about do. the direct listing for Coinbase? Obviously that was a mega IPO. See, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of the uh, of the digital currency yet. Not to the degree that it's been. I, mean, I could see, I see its place. I see where it, you know, its future. But it's like it's raw. It's not. It's not fully formed. It's not. You know, it's not fungible as an actual currency. It's just not. And but it's, but but again, it's not that you like. I don't hate Tesla. I don't hate EVs. I love them. You know, Tesla. You know, I'm sorry. Have you seen the take in? But anyway, take on. But I'm just saying, um, I, I don't not love them. I'm just saying the degree of love and, and indulgence and pricing and premiums attributed to that, it's got to it's got to hold up to that. And I I don't see that. And then we're not even talking about in the case of Bitcoin, the environmental cost. And that's huge. And so you know, you, the tremendous okay. amount of energy market to trade uh, to to I could should say stop. Yes, yeah, the bond buyer it would be a whole. I don't see, think you're going to see bond buyers, a uh, bond you know bond bit by Bitcoin bonds. I don't I don't think you're going to see. And I'm using Bitcoin as the as the generic, not the name anyone in particular. But I don't because we're going to be like you know really. I mean, we ask all those pesky questions and, and we want, you know, reliability. We want, you know, and so I don't see that. Whereas the equity market, you know, we got cash to burn and, you know, where can I do? And so it's just, it's just different. 
but that doesn't mean we're wrong. And that you doesn't mean that the oil market. I mean, obviously there is just, there are a bunch of zombie companies in oil and gas. Sure. And you can clearly right. see what happened in 14 through 16, that whole oil recession. And right. And that's continuing. I mean, the, look yeah. at all the gas well, get oil and gas wells leaking everywhere, all over. I'm in Texas, you know, it's covered up here. And we, we haven't even addressed the entire problem with the existing fossil space that, you know, I mean, and demand, you know, it, it, it's fluctuate, but demand is fundamentally lower and trending lower for the foreseeable future. So what do we do? And we're awash in, in oil and gas in the, in the, around the globe. We just are. And if you have fundamental systemic demand, it's like, I liken it to the paper industry. I used to cover the paper industry years ago. And that was an old, mature industry. And it just, um, you know, we were making hand over fist. The, you could always make a reliable, well, until you couldn't, you know, and you get China growing out their own. This huh? is a different market. Copper is being accumulated. You know, Copper's in, different. Copper's not no, oil. No, but not just copper, but oil and lumber. The, I know. The well, lumber is, uh, is a catch up because people forget in tw just before COVID hit, the market was already sinking and we were already sinking into a recession. So we've had a systemic change in the way that people view living and working. That's going to, we haven't really played that out. How is that going to be? But the people that had money to play in the market the whole time, they have money to sell their house and go out and buy a new house. That's not all of the population. That's kind of like, you know, like you ever heard the uh, comic Eddie Izzard? I love him. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Oh God, he's funny. He does a beat where Christopher Columbus lands in America and he steps out, he's like, this is amazing and nobody's here at all. Excuse me. What is the, you know, he's ignoring everybody that's there. Well, that's where we're ignoring a huge part of the economy that hadn't recovered yet. We don't know when they're going to recover or how. And so the part of the economy that has money, we only care about them, but they're not the only drivers and we're ignoring the lag that's still there. And there's a lag with a, a significant I mean, millions in the population that continue to be financially pressured if not completely devastated that's that comeback is there we have health, our health care live hand to mouth our health care system is you know tattered if we ever re, you know showed any you know re, showed how broken our healthcare system it's a way we were able to handle or not handle you know covid i mean if you want to look at watch a microcosm of, of everything where things are wrong more wrong than you think look at texas texas is richer than canada if texas was a country it's, it's a bigger GDP than Canada. We also have the biggest population of unemployed. This is before COVID hit. The biggest population of you know uninsured. The biggest population of uh, working people that can't afford their health care costs because our health care is also more expensive than anywhere else. I mean, right here in Texas. So when we have all of these things that we're completely ignoring, we're not supporting businesses. We're telling businesses they can't do what they need to do to keep themselves safe. I mean, all the things are... Watch how Texas plays out because, you know, and people are right now packing up station wagons and pickups all over the place, moving here because the politics, they think, are going to be better. And I'm like, no, please. Don't. But uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm covered up in the crazy right now. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm already here. But it, it's watch and see how but you Texas make good plays points. Out. I mean, you make solid points. It, this uh, I have to ask, what is breaking for you of this market sentiment and euphoria and you know unreasonableness whether it be a tesla an arc you know the 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 spacs we could go on and on there are is just a rotation endless rotation of buying in fact that was just a comment that you made and uh oh where did it go you're spot on with the valuation and opportunities to buy more and now that they've gotten these stimulus checks credit card debt is just guaranteed to go up from here because they're just not going to want to stop. <laughs> well, but also we have to understand the people, again, with that dichotomy, the people that were waiting, waiting for that stimulus check, they're not in the market. They needed that stimulus check to pay bills. You know, Some have so. definitely come into the market. I mean, I know in my business, this is a huge influx of trading accounts, whether it be the Robin right. Hoods. But or they the were, Fox. those are people that probably, they weren't the ones, you know, I mean, Maybe they're living in their basement, mom's basement. I don't know what the deal with the Robin Hood folks, but I don't know. But I'm just saying the people that were like, you know, through that right in the market, that's not the that's not the part of the economy that's still struggling. They no, were already no, okay. They, and they so all, we they, need they to, all we bought GameStop. Wait, people time. are not the right. I'm yeah. So I'm just Did you the, ever do a report, by the way, on GameStop? Did you ever look into that crazy? I, I did, but they don't have bonds. Remember, I, you know, I they were already failing, you know, and so they were already you know, like they were going 
they were okay. going under. Maybe they had bonds. I I don't know. There's just a I cover my my focus tends to be like you know industrial, um, home building, healthcare. Uh, and then, you know, drama queens. I love, I love the drama queens that kind of jump out at me. So like the, you know, drama king. a Tesla falls in my transportation because, you know, transportation, airlines, OEMs, you know, I, yeah. I like that. Um, other things, but there are, there are ways to play this, you know, they're not sexy and exciting, but the, you know, I mean, right now, I think we're, we're, we need to be careful about the snapback versus what's real um, recovery. You know, what is, you know, because we've got a build up, we got bottlenecks, we've got supply disruption, and everything. That's gonna that's gonna smooth out though. That's mm-hmm. gonna smooth out over the next, you know, by the end of the year. Yeah, chips included. And exactly. So yeah. all that's gonna smooth out. But what's real? What's what's real? People are companies are not gonna commit money capital. And you know, and remember, we're talking most of corporate corporate America, they were buying back stock, they weren't doing it on capex. So there's there's you know, starved capex everywhere all over the place. So you buy United Rentals. You know, United Rentals, they're not sexy, but they have huge, big, fat, luscious margins. They are a lot of- I love my cash. safety list. It's 53 I'm stocks you know, long. It's, I love, yes, some is cyclical, like, some is yeah. just boring staples, but oh exactly. my God, they're so steady, exactly. Freddie. But they're also <laughs> but they're also better buy. So, you know, like yeah. they, you make a better yield on United Rentals than Tesla. They're higher credit quality rating and they actually earn that credit quality rating. They have, you know, cash, they have- Luscious big fat margins, you know, even though I think like 40% even though margins, if not better. I mean, it's like, whoa. So if you look at it, it's like when I'm looking at investment grade, investment grade companies are like, it's like going to Cheesecake Factory. They're so I think the exponential earnings growth is going to be in these value plays for 21 and 22. I I think, you know, not just the yield. Uh, you know, steepening that we've had, which is, you know, right. flattened in the past few. We few need that normalization weeks. to come back in the market, though. We need, we need yes, that, that we need yeah. that. And I see the, the Fed's probably paying attention and maybe fa- they focus on the short end and and the long end, you know, playing out. But what my I think our biggest concern is people being, you know, not being able to distinguish with, you know, a strong snapback being like, you know, wow, that's great. Uh, that's rec- that's you know recovery and, and and we're back to here but we were here before and that's a big problem we're gonna have you know and paying attention to these big giant percentage numbers when you see absolute number we're gonna see that with job numbers you know we did that that's why like the 2008 you know recession um we didn't see jobs come back it was over over a decade before actual number of jobs that were lost started to come back close to that what happened to those folks they're not in the unemployment numbers. They were not in the participation numbers. They, you know, what happened to those folks? Because there were physically less jobs. We're going to see that again, that same phenomena again, because corporations, people have learned how to work differently. They are going to live differently. So we're going to, it's a cultural change. But how does that look next year? And then, oh, by the way, we want to continue to jack prices. I have a bad And wage okay. inflation for those, you know. For companies. For but, companies. But, you know, companies have been getting by with not paying, you know, living wage. To people, so you know that's got it. That that's where the support of the stimulus that I'm seeing that's going to actually target those areas and businesses that are having trouble absorbing and evolving that way. That's actually a constructive thing because we actually make it so more people can actually make a living and actually pay their bills. Then that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. But you know, between now and then, um, it, it's just you know companies learning to. Uh, to move that direction and, and, and investors understanding what's the difference and seeing how the market does play out. Because a lot of the reasons, for example, look at women, executive women. You know why a lot of us started our company? Because we couldn't get a job that would pay us what we are, what we were, and they wouldn't promote us. You know, and we're training the guy that's the director's son, you know, from college, you understand, and you pray, protect, you train. This actually happened to me. You know, and that guy gets, you know, he's he gets hired, he get, help him out. And that kind of thing. I mean, for years and years and years, you're boom, boom, boom. You go out and start your own business. We don't get the funding. And if we're 25, three 25 year old guys from Goldman, people are throwing hundreds of millions of dollars and I can name the, you know, because they got, they're going to do something. You know, nobody's, shoot, you know, looking up, you know. This I you know. know. <laughs> Samantha, what can I do yeah. to help you grow your platform? Because I, I, I see what, I would like to hear what you got planned. Nobody's out there knocking on my door. If they are, you know, I, I'll let them in because I got big plans. I'll lie, but I don't have help and I don't have, you know, funding other than what I'm coming up with and bootstrap and other kind of thing. This is all over the place. So this is growth that could be happening. That's not. 
hundred percent. I, I, I tweet about this all the time. We help, you know, women entrepreneurs, we're helping the economy grow. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's yeah. mathematical. And, but, but it's been too long that companies are able to just like pay where they want, because there's really, there's a reason why there's plenty of folks always standing there, regardless, even now three, 4% unemployment, everybody's got it. No, they don't. They don't have a job and they don't have the job or they don't have the job they could have, or they're not paid what they could be. And why? Because companies don't have to, they don't have to. And so where are all these people going? And, and we're, gonna ha we're going through another phase of that that people aren't going to pay attention to necessarily. Because if you just pay attention to just the, the flat unemployment number, I use actually a basket of things that I look at that are like, what is the actual a household basket of things that uh, people actually have to buy? Just a limited thing, not everything. Well, look at how much housing costs have gone up. Insurance, health insurance, cars. All these things that people have to buy, they suffer if they don't buy them. You know, the whole thing with the housing, Ooh. I was tracking back in 2012, that by 2012, houses had already increased average price of housing in the Commerce Department, it was already higher than it was in 2006 before the recession started and incomes had not leveled. And, in, and home builders were increasing pricing every quarter by double digit and they did continue to do that all the way through 2014. Now I, we're talking about, I saw a guy yesterday, I saw a report yesterday talking about, we should just increase rates and make mortgages more expensive. That's all shut this down. Well, the problem with that is that those aren't the people buying the houses, the, the, the speculators, they're paying cash. You increase mm -hmm. mortgage rates, you're going to hurt the vulnerable, the people that actually have to borrow money to buy a house. And they're already dealing with this outrageous house price, which increases their down payment and their mortgage payment. And so dirt cheap, we've had profoundly dirt cheap mortgage rates since 2010. Yes, but we also had BlackRock come in in 2012 oh, yeah. and through great fi financing and Deutsche, from Deutsche Bank and it has uh, evolved to be one in five houses owned is by a corporation. Absolutely, <laughs> but guess what? They're not getting a mortgage. They're getting a they're getting corporate financing. That's not even the same thing. So Vicky and Samantha want to go yeah. and buy a house. Exactly. We've got to get a mortgage. So you increase the mortgage rates. You heard Vicky and Samantha. You don't heard BlackRock. Yeah. You know, and they're borrowing because they can, because you know, it's almost free money. I mean, but it's they're removing borrowing. supply also that we're already low on Absolutely. for housing. They're yeah, removing supply up and, and they're not the only ones. I mean, Beezer was out buying up houses to have rental neighborhoods so we could jack up rents. So we can't, so the average consumer can't buy and they can't afford to rent. What are they going to do for a living? And we're not, we're not, we're, we're just acting like this is just, oh, it'll work. It's fine, fine. And we'll just figure out other ways for people to buy it, Well, it, we already saw what happens when the system is completely broken and unable to handle a crisis that you can't just wish away. You know, you could like, I don't, feel like climate change is real. well you know whatever i don't feel covid is real. well covid is real and it doesn't care if you care and we saw what happens when we're when we gutted our preparation and we don't help and we don't pay attention to it and then everything gets ahead of us and we have to actually physically shut down and people are like what now well we did that because you wouldn't stay home because you wouldn't put your mask on and we continue to go through the, and everything just got worse and worse and we keep denying why well that happens on big ways too with the economy and what's going on with the consumer and what if you flesh out and not look at them as numbers but actual people and what do they actually make and what are their actual bills and how are they actually paying for things or not and what happens to those people when they can't and we we have a whole body of you know information out there that's not tracked that's not because it doesn't fit in with you know we're just looking at where the numbers we get back down to four percent unemployment we're good we're golden but no, the market doesn't because it's care. Because percent of the jobs available, not four percent of all the jobs we used to have. But the market what doesn't care. Those other the market doesn't care. They might care about taxes care. going up. They might care That's right. <laughs> about. The market wage. doesn't care, but the market doesn't care until it has to. The market didn't believe COVID until COVID blew up, right? Oh my gosh! I, trust me on this one. I, I wrote uh, January thirty first: perfect storm, coronavirus, and market risks, and there were twenty three hundred yeah. cases reported at that time. And I'm watching this going, the market doesn't know it yet. Under the surface, it was clearly there was a sold to you market Absolutely. under the surface. And it took one month, literally, you know, for the real divergence to come in before that the February 24th gap down on a Monday. And then we just cascaded 35%. But I don't see it now. Like, I look for this. I, I can I can spot this. <laughs> Well, because it's not, it's not. You're still not, not selling. So, <laughs> right. Well, it's not so defined. And we have now people that can just write off, you know, you know, half a million people dead and like, and millions sick. 
from it, not just a half a million people that, and like still saying it didn't happen. So you're going to have an element that's always going to be like, I don't care. But I mean, a year ago, on March 13th, I published my report. U.S. hospitals on U.S. hospitals is called uh, in sickness or in health, in sickness and in health. In health. And at that time, there were 1,600 cases in the U.S. and uh, 200 deaths. And at that time, there was already data. I saw a chart yesterday from a report that came out talking about whether airlines should sell their middle seat or not. And it was mapped out of a plane and where you can sit in the plane. And if you don't wear your mask, how you can transmit it. Now, airlines have been really good about keep making sure people wear their masks. But you are still have the Karens and Kens. I'm not wearing my mask. I'm not breathing my waist. You're like, oh, my God. But anyway, you still have that. So you have people are going to be people. I saw that same chart in February last year. Taiwan published, you know, in Taiwan, the Chinese were already publishing. Here's a subway car. Here's a bus. Here's a conference room. And they had the people mapped out where they sat yep. and how and far away and, and that, that they transmitted the virus. Yeah. We knew things a year ago that we ignored that we're still coming up with now. They were still denying it. So it's what we, the, the impact is the best as far as we're all, we're still, we have so much money still available and so many people that still have money. And they were like, you know, psh, that's them. I don't care. It's not me, you know. It's not our culture well, to talk, comply well, that, very well. Europeans yeah. are better at it. Asians are better at it. We're not so we're, we're non-compliant here on many. We're reasons. not. We're, we're not out. compliant. Until, but you know what? It's 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 now because of that. COVID's here to stay. We lost oh. our chance to contain it. It's going to be around for around. Yep. What and we I said, need to do is hopefully we get like I just got my shot, my first shot finally in Texas. You couldn't even get a shot. Because I wasn't old enough and I was sick and I'm not older, you know, I'm older, but I'm, you know, I, you know, I was like, you know, just walk around, um, you know, staying away from my neighbors and my UPS guy and all their, you know, you go to a restaurant or whatever and you're, you know, the old ladies in the grocery store or whatever, they're just like, you know, reach around and paw everything because you got a mask on, they're going to make their point. So I, that, so I hadn't gone anywhere, but I finally got my first shot. Um, uh, and I, a couple, last week and I get the last one of the 30th. And so that will ease my life. You know, I will feel more comfortable to get out and about, but I would still be avoiding people and, and other people, you know, will be getting sick, but more people are getting the vaccine. So over time, it's just going to be, the problem is that we have to face or that we have to deal with is we think it'll happen here. And that's with all of these, we have these catalysts. We're expecting at this point, we'll be here. And I think all we're going to ultimately end up pushing all those dates out. And that's the risk. If you're, you know, as an investor, because, you know, the company and we can like wish it away and hope, 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 but the company can't hit targets because, you know, hospitals, for example, we can't get back fully, you know, uh, we fired most everybody in the hospital that doesn't work in the emergency. And by room. the way, a lot of hospitals are owned by private equity. Oh, absolutely. HTA <laughs> is the biggest, you know, hey, I look, I mean, I follow HTA Community Health and Tenant. You know, I know what they're doing. And, tenant. and oh, they yeah. fired people everywhere. They fired people all over the place. And, and they have kept people on. Why? Because they can hire them back. They can hire, they can pay temporary physicians and nurses, which are more expensive than keeping a regular, they can pay them as needed. And still HCA reported the bigger, a bigger, bigger profit in fourth quarter 29 last year than they did in 2019 before COVID. And let me tell you why that's weird because the were the most unprofitable place in your whole hospital is your emergency room that's where folks show up that don't have insurance that's where folks show up with you know the sniffles or the covid or you know whatever which covid costs way more to treat than flu it's much more deadly and 20 percent of the people that come in with it they have to be hospitalized and 20 percent of those have to go on ventilators and you know i mean it just it's bad it's more expensive they can go through all that and not have the surgeries hospitals make their money on surgeries and expensive treatments they don't make their money on the emergency room the emergency room is they make money despite the emergency room. So HCA was able to make, you know, a, a bigger profitable quarter in the fourth quarter of 2020 than 2019. What's up with that? Was it with government subsidies? No, they gave their money back. Now, hospitals pay, and that's, I should add, hospitals write off like the top 30% of their revenue as uncompensated care. So they're not, they don't, that's not even 100% of their revenue. Mm -hmm. And they're still making big profits. That tells you the bloat that's there. And it's not yeah. just the healthcare system, but our healthcare system in general. There's so many broken things. So anyway, what's, your, like, what's your next special focus? I, I know Tesla is an ongoing focus I'm and you're very to... patient. And then you mentioned the SPAC space. Um, what else? And, what, and of course, I'm the trying to market. find the right. I'm trying to find those things that are that are good. 
you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like everybody else. We're all exhausted with all the things that are wrong and all the, did that if you just say that we're tired of that? You know, what is actually going to work? Like United Rentals, for example, there are companies out there that make sense in this environment when, they, when, when it's flux. And I, I'm, I'm going with flux. I'm going with two things. My, my overriding theme is I am, well, three things. I, this is more encouraging um, stimulus and aid being directed more constructively than I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I mean, really going to the muscle, the blood's going to the muscle that needs it, right? That's, we haven't had that, you know, yep. and that makes it, that's got to help. That's, that helps not just, you know, it's psychologically and all these things that helps. That's good. That's a positive. Number two, we are getting past COVID. Well, more people are getting, mm -hmm. we're going to have to deal with, we need to get people out there enough. I'm just like, want to get my shot done before the variant hits here, because, you know, I mean, we're just going to get these variants. It's a thing we're going to deal with every year. Um, and we have to call, but culturally we're going to get used to that. I mean, people will, because they get tired of, you know, I, I can't go so-and-so or so-and-so won't go out with me or we can't go there. I can't get in that restaurant because they want whatever my, my employer what my requires. And that will, that will fly. Employers will be allowed to require that they're allowed to have drug testing of their employees. So, yep. you know, yep. they're going to be, a, they're going to be allowed to be able to, because they have to be able to protect their, their employees and their customers, their insurance companies are going to demand it. What are you doing to keep your people safe? So, I mean, that will happen. So eventually you have a vaccine card, so to speak, when you travel, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, why not? I mean, I got a driver's license, you know, I mean, I, I hear, I'm, so I'm, learn I'm, to live with COVID. I agree with you. I, I said exactly. that we're going to have to, we're going to, and, that, and we will. And I think by year end, like the second half, when the, when the surge comes back, I'm hoping, I don't think it's going to be as bad as this time is what we've got. Hopefully let's hope it's not, but I don't think it's going to be as bad. So when it's less bad, it's kind of like you're looking at a chart, you know, we have it down, but it's not as down as much as it did. And we, you know, less volume on that down, we, you know, stronger on the upside. And I think that's what we're going to see. So I'm, I'm structurally positive. I, I'm, the concern is don't get so, no, not so fast, you know, chief. I think it's going to be take a little longer than you hope. And what companies will be expected that? What companies are hard and fast needing to hit the number? or they will be more impacted than people think. And that's kind of what I'm looking at. So and, you said there were three, there were three. I did say that. So, so um, kind of like the, the, I think, the, I think that it's, I think the third thing was it's going to take longer. It's going to take longer than we're, than we're expecting. That's I think the third thing. So the first thing is it is happening. The second thing is uh, we're not discounting the risk. We're not discounting the risk that's there enough. Um, and we are, uh, attributing we're still attributing too much um to the teslas and the companies out there that are we'll see for example we work when it comes out how it, if, if, if that even you know how that gets done if it gets done and any market um, risks in particular besides covid and and you know the reaction if you will of um just general sentiment on these celebrity CEOs and, and speculative asset classes, which will always be there. There'll always be new financial instruments that come to market to make money. And Coinbase is going to drive lots of activity in traditional banks to get involved in this because they're clearly making money and they don't want to be left well, Here's the thing. If banks get involved, <laughs> if banks get involved, I mean, regulators are already Regulators involved. will get involved. That's a positive for investors. Okay. Yeah. Because yep. we need, I know people like, you know, no regular, when you have no regulations, you know, people are always screaming about the regulations. About if Wild you don't have regulations, companies won't do their thing. You know, yeah. ask, I mean, I, I know a lot of people, you know, blue collar workers, you know, ask a railroad worker if he would feel safe if the railroad did not have to answer to the FRA. If the yeah. railroad did not have to have, you know, I mean, do they think that would be a safe work environment? No, you have to have oversight. I mean, there are people because if they don't have oversight, they won't do it. I mean, every right. job, every every regulation, every guideline is there because something bad happened. That's so why we it, gotta have it. It's not a bad thing, but so not what's your market market stance and kind of like to to I'm cautiously, I agree I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm thinking that um I, I'm thinking that. The things that I'm going to be, I think my expectations, I think I, I'm expecting my expectations will be better. The, the larger market, the, you know, you can't, the irrational, you can't gauge the irrational. If they think it's going to the moon no matter what, and they're happy no matter what's announced, well, you can't gauge them. And they're, they're throwing money into the market and they're buying up options. And they're, I mean, there's structural problems there. We've got passive investing still a huge part 
of you know running the market number i mean running market numbers so you know that's structurally those are things you can't do but i mean fundamentally coming at it from a fundamental standpoint not just protecting pensions at all costs that's right and that so more regulatory oversight would be positive for pensions because they've just kind of been it's kind of turned into wild west there's been no one really looking out Certainly no one looking out for the small investor. So certainly no one holding boards accountable. I mean, look at Elon Musk's board. I mean, no one on that board is holding <laughs> accountable at all. But he's just he's just the most egregious. He's like the most one everybody can point to. I know that guy. But that's all over the country. Mm-hmm. You know, we more regulation, you know, more. I think that will be something that the markets will not be. It's funny, you have the people that will drill down every single line or there, but they don't want the, you know, no government. Well. Okay, you just went through and found all these things that the company's not reporting. You know, more oversight is a good thing for that and protecting the investor and the small investors, you know, taking advantage of small and sophisticated investors. They don't have protection. You know, it's kind of like, you know, well, you're stupid. Give me your money and and, and I'll take more, you know, give me more. Okay, so we we agree on the regime change as far as not just politically, but also fiscally. So spending is going up, taxes going up, regulations going up. So, and I think because the source of the money, the money that was fueling the market, the huge buybacks and everything, that's not there. So I think we, you know, they're going to kick that back in as soon as, you know, the Fed lightens up, if it does ever. I think, well, there's, there's talk about looking into, you know, companies just, you know, willy nilly, you know, buying back stock. You know, that is, you know, that's irresponsible. That is not, all, you know, why is that the best and highest use of your money when you're underspending a CapEx and you're paying your, your employees below wage? You're, I, it'd be hard to justify that that's the best way you're doing to, you know, the best thing you could do. So I, I don't know that, I, I think that- um, But it also created positive. the longest, strongest, ooh, sorry, bull market with creating, you know, uh, fewer shares available. Yeah, but that's kind of like- might make it <laughs> Exactly, but that's kind of like, you know- That'll be back in fashion again We soon. gotta get away, <laughs> yeah. But we gotta get away from, you know, that's, again, that's, we everything is boiled down to the unjustifies of me. Mike makes right. You know, I've got more than you do, so I'm, you know, I'm going to do it. And all of those things, none of those same things have to do with truth or justice or, you know, that's accurate. It's just because you can't, so you do. That doesn't mean you're right. And we've got, that's what's been driving the market. And so I have plenty of money and I'm just going to buy it and I'm going to drive things up even though it's not worth that. And the rest of us are like, okay, I'll sell it to you then. And so, because all these buys, they have a seller. People are selling. You know, there's two sides of every transaction. So, you know, and, and coming at it from the bond market, um, I'm not worried. I mean, I think that you've got, I'm more worried that all the companies that have, that have out there borrowed all this debt, the dirt sheet numbers and way below what they should have been, that investors weren't compensated. And these are weaker companies that got really low interest rates. And if interest rates go up, they're going to have to actually borrow at rates that are more <laughs> to, oh, hi, sweetheart. That's her way of saying, "Mom." Yes, see I put me. my. I did. I put my secretaries um in their in their room so they don't help. Us. <laughs> they would be barking. She she's like, I'm, uh, you you got to feed me now." <laughs> so I'm gonna. Uh, yes, I'm, I am not just. I'm not just gonna close so I can feed my my cat. That's not it. I am looking at the time going, I yes, can't believe Sorry. this is no, it's phenomenal. I could talk to you every day, not just the accent, which I we love. Should. We should catch up and just talk. This is, you know, I, and humble also, cause grew up on a farm. I just don't, it was near Canada, not in Texas. <laughs> so there's no <laughs> accent. I, I could oh. try one, but this has been fabulous. And I'm really grateful for those who have, you know, stuck it out because we've covered in, in two hours, um Ooh, the shoot, we went social i mean from some behavioral psychology to the tesla deep dive and forensic accounting to and cheesecake factory <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even, there, there's, there's way too many topics and you're so super smart and sharp across a spectrum um politically i mean you could run for office but i mean this analysis oh. viewpoint and how credit leads equities in in your patient stance in like quarter by quarter in dribs and drabs until all of a sudden boom yes i will feed you you've never missed a meal so i want to <laughs> thank you sincerely that thank you, you for doing I'm this the phone and, and talk some more but yeah, I'm, let's do that i think but we should. for now i'm gonna wish everyone a great evening you do um, too 
I'm going to post this on my YouTube channel tonight after. And thanks to your audience. They've been very patient. Oh, thank you. They'll be, and and again, on. the podcast and the YouTube viewing. I, I will also kind of segment where we kind of went into the Tesla deep dive because I think that's going to be, by the way, um, a timestamp. We're going to, we're going to be, yeah, I, I actually we're going to be looking that. back on All that. My, you do that same thing too. All of my reports are a continuing conversation. I always go back to, and I mean, we need to do that if we can't revisit, you know, what, yes. what are we talking but No, about? but that synopsis I think is going to be picked up and, and referred to again in the future. We're going to, we're going to go back and say, Vicki called it. <laughs> so <laughs> or not. Or not. No, I think, I think, I think, I think that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much Thank again, you. and everyone. I appreciate. Um, on Tuesday, Jonathan Gibbons joins me again for Macro to Micro. We'll we'll do some more market structure stuff. Um, but this was very enlightening and just inspiring too. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Have a good night, everyone. Bye bye. -bye.